An auspicious beginning. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I know what you're thinking. You're like, but Adam and Paul, it's Thursday. Why is Dice Friends? Dice Friends is a Monday thing. Ah, that's where you're mistaken. It's actually Monday. Yeah. Yeah, we've gone back in time. Sorry, the work week's got to start again. I don't make the rules. Wow. Yeah, sorry. I I, if I had known that uh, the actual like calendar was based on when we stream, <laughs> when friends, we stream and... I would have paid more attention to the schedule. Yeah, well, unlucky. Yeah. Well, seeing as how I don't have a Monday or a Friday, it doesn't bother me either way. You know, <laughs> just because of what I do for work. Like, I, you, 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 those days still happen. You yeah, know? <laughs> but I don't have like the classic sense of a Monday well, or Friday. Yeah, yeah. Right? yeah. I mean, Hi friends. For for the a large yeah. the like for the majority of of my working life, yeah. Saturdays have been my most busy day because yeah. like that's when we do all the loading ready run shooting. Yeah. So yeah, my schedule's been messed up. Yeah. Now I've I've just gotten I've done doing this for like a couple of years now and my, my schedule's messed. I don't have any concept of I just I routinely forget what day of the week it is. Yeah, my, I, I evaluate days by like what the what streams are going on. Yeah. So then when we, when we shuffle, yeah, when gauge. we shuffle the schedule, it yeah. messes thing everything. Oh out. yeah. <laughs> All right, friends. Hi, welcome to Dice Friends, a special Thursday edition in lieu of the long game because James and Ben are both gone to Pax Unplugged currently. Mm -hmm. um, so if you are in Philadelphia currently, or when you watch, I guess by the time you see this on YouTube, it'll be too late. But if you're in Philadelphia. You want to go say hi to us? We have a booth that uh, I would assume is the Bandland in at PAX, yep. and uh, we're actually debuting a new set of dice to sell. Yeah, yeah, limited uh, edition. Um, that's not like they're not limited edition forever, but limited edition in the sense that we only made a f some of them yeah. because we weren't sure. We weren't sure know, just what like thing, but they look super swank. Yeah, I don't know if you can uh, see them somewhere. Uh, oh, somebody, there... uh, the, the, there's a, um, the, there's a tweet about it that oh, is there a tweet somebody about them? will probably put in the chat okay. very quickly. So yeah, I think you can order them online, probably. Uh, you will be able to. You will after. be able to. There you the, go. Yeah, there they uh, are. Yep. The uh, uh, Pax Unplugged is the debut of them. That's cool. Uh, and then they'll be uh, put online. Oh, that's rad. Yeah, yeah. Oh, sick. So yeah. Uh, but before we get started with this adventure, we got to do a couple things. First of all... This stream is sponsored in part by Wormwood Gaming. Um, if you use, if you're in the U.S. and use the affiliate code LRR, you get free shipping everywhere else in the world. Use LRR World, you get ten dollars off the shipping. Uh, we use all of the Wormwood products for all of our like dice rolling trays and for our D and D streams. We use the towers and everything else, and they're super high quality. Um, I think they do a lot of custom orders as well, which is uh, I think uh, one of the the benefit or one of the draws to using Wormwood is a lot of people can get their stuff customized. I actually saw somebody uh, tweeted at me. They got a dice box, but they got uh, the bones of trees and the skins of beasts engraved. What? Really? The, yeah. On the side <laughs> of it. Yeah. So I can't remember who it was, if you're watching or if you're in Twitch chat or anything, but yeah, I saw that tweet. Can I that get was a, pretty cool. Can I get a dice box with your, with your slogan on it? Yeah. But we, 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 don't, we don't have a slogan. Yeah, we don't have a slogan. You know, the bones of trees and the skin. <laughs> God damn it. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, that's wormwoodgaming.com. The bones of trees and the skins of beasts are not valid. In the, you did it too early. <laughs> no, I forgot. I always forget about the, the honor not realms <laughs> thing. Ah, well, we tried. Yeah, well, yeah, it's close enough. Um, also, this stream is brought to you by you at patreon.com slash loading ready run. Your continued support is a reason why we were able to have this studio and do these streams and me and Paul to hang out together and all my friends have jobs because of it. And we can't thank you enough. It's pretty yeah. incredible. Even like when I was doing, um, ask Lair, mm. and they were like, how do you balance like what this job is? And I was like, well, I mean, the fact that this exists in the in oh you were there i guess yeah, yeah yeah but the fact that this exists in the capacity that it does is like a miracle right like 12 friends like honest to god yeah. friends yeah this this would uh um you know if you're if you're in high school like the career counselor doesn't really talk about this kind of <laughs> stuff <laughs> it's a career counselor it's like yeah if you want to start up a thing a, a youtube group with your 12 best friends yeah then just, sure just yeah, yeah go just ahead. do it so yeah thank you for your support also if you uh subscribe to us on youtube um not only do you get to help us support us in another avenue, if that's how you want to do it, 
but also you get to submit questions to the Askler monthly uh, shows. That you can yeah, find. and if you haven't seen the latest one, it's uh, Adam and Matt and Beach. Beach. Yep. And uh, talking about all sorts of interesting things uh, about uh, like what's their... the most cowardly food? Exactly, the most the most cowardly food. Yeah, apparently it's seedless grapes. Which I agree with. Spoilers. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. well, <laughs> it's in the title of the YouTube show. When they click on it, they'll be like, oh. Cowards food is seedless grapes. I was like pudding. Oh, pudding? But if there's black pudding, that's metal as hell. I guess. I mean, it depends <laughs> if we're talking pudding in the, in the British sense of like dessert. Yeah. Yeah, I guess. Maybe. But seedless grapes, I mean, Matt had a compelling argument for why yeah, seedless yeah. grapes. It's like taking all the danger out of like a yeah. already let not that dangerous food, right? <laughs> so it's like yeah, take well. all the danger out of grapes. <laughs> <laughs> all right, stopping the thousands of people yeah. dead from grapes every year. <laughs> stopping grape-related deaths, one grape at a time. All right, so we know why we're here and how we got here, but what the what is what we're asking today? So if you have never watched me do one of these before. I have been playing through, there are a set of books called In the Fighting Fantasy Line by Ian Livingston and Steve Jackson, who are the D&D dudes. They did, they did D&D, right? They, did, they do D&D? They still do D&D? I, they wrote a lot of stuff for D&D, right? All Some sorts of all sorts fantasy, fantasy type fantasy stuff. Fantasy RPG stuff. So I've been playing through these books. They're essentially choose-your-own-adventure books, um, but I will roll up a character before we start. Um, they're not the D&D dudes. Oh, they did I, Munchkin. Yeah, yeah, they did I, Munchkin. I believe um, one or both of them may have written supplements for D&D, but they are not. Like, Gary Gygax is, like, the D&D The D&D dude. Yeah, but um, he did D&D stuff. And they've all, uh, Steve Jackson, in particular, has done tons of uh, other RPG stuff. Yeah, GURPS. He did GURPS. Steve Jackson did GURPS. I've never played GURPS, but I just always hear people talk about it. Mm. Especially when they, they were trying to make you, like, them sound, like, smarter than you. Like, oh, I played GURPS. GURPS was like, uh, okay. uh, super... Like ridiculously popular at one point. Um, yeah. There were like supplement. There were so many supplements coming out for it every week. It yeah. was crazy. So these books are pretty simple. Combat's relatively simple. I mean, part of the joy of it is sometimes I'm going to take a wrong turn and I'm just going to die instantly, which is kind of fun. Um, but anyway, we need to roll up a character. We always have to start with this. Uh, there's no magic in this one, which was in the last one, the mm. Citadel of Chaos. So this is just like a regular old fighting fantasy book. Paul was telling me that this book um, is new? Yeah, so the fighting fantasy um, is a series, the books uh, originally came out I believe in the uh, early 90s, late 80s. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, sort of uh, crested in popularity and uh, they printed a whole bunch of them. Uh, and then just recently they've reprinted, they're, they're, they, it was taken over by Scholastic, I think. Yeah. And they're reprinting, they reprinted a bunch of them, I guess, sort of the, the greatest hits. Uh, but this one, I believe there's, this is like the sixth one in the series of the new printings. This is actually a new one. So yeah. they got Ian Livingston, Ian Livingston back and back, uh, got him to, uh, yeah, make a, make a new one. It's interesting. The Fighting Fantasy books are by Ian Livingston and Steve Jackson. Some of them as a whole. Some of them are written by both of them. Some of them are written by one. and Some are written by the other. Yeah. I feel like, you know, if you're a aficionado, you have like a strong preference one way or another. <laughs> yeah, you're, who's your flavor? Yeah. Or, yeah. or like if they're written by both, you're like, hmm, mm. this bit of, this text box is a Steve Jackson classic, kind of Classic text box. Ian. Yeah, this is a classic Ian trap. And if I know Ian Livingston, I know that he would do it this way. Mm. Uh, okay, so we name our character. Our character's name is Otaku Jeff, as, as is our right. Otaku. Is the, this is uh, uh, a long, long? He comes from a long, long line, a long <laughs> line of otaku Jeffs, or is this actually the same otaku Jeff? This is the same one. He's immortal. He's uh -huh. timeless. He's kind of like uh, who's timeless? <laughs> I'm trying to think of a timeless character who never dies. He's like the Watcher from Marvel. Right? Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. Never dies. And does he die? Never, never does it. Well, he dies at one point. I think the Watcher actually dies. Yeah, yeah, I, maybe that's a horrible example. Okay. He's like James Bond. Yeah. He's like James Bond. Otaku, wait, wait, Otaku Jeff is more of like a title than an actual like, person. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, uh, like, uh, like, uh, yeah, like James Bond. 
I'm trying to think of a superhero. That is, like Batman, right? Those people, different people can be Batman. I, like the Green Lantern? I mean, immortality is not technically one of Batman's powers. The Doctor. Like Doctor Who. Okay, yeah. Doctor, Doctor, Doctor Who works. Yeah. Doctor Hoomst. Hoomst did it of. Or the Dread Pirate Roberts, yeah. Yeah, there we go. All right. Robin Hood, yeah. Mad Max, you know. So, we need to roll some stats. Uh, the way this game works is there are three stats, skill, stamina, and luck, which offer, I mean, it's pretty straightforward what they all offer. Skill is my combat stat, which I will use when I'm rolling uh, combat and some, some uh, situations where I'll have to roll, like, sometimes I think it's like you roll your skill and then you add it and then they get a choice to do whatever you got to do. Um, a high skill is great. I don't want to yeah. roll low because <laughs> if Basically, I roll low, this... high skill and low skill is like the difference between like easy mode and hard mode. <laughs> yeah, it was like the last time I was avoiding every combat when I was doing Citadel Chaos because my skill was like seven. But on my first time when I did Warlock of Firetop Mountain, my skill was like a twelve or something, and I was like, "Yeah, I'll fight anything. Yeah, it's no super worries. easy." Uh, stamina are my hit points, and luck is used for a variety of different things. Mostly uh, in-game choices will be like test your luck. And then I have to roll 2d6 and roll under my luck or under or equal to my luck score. And then I get lucky and then I get the, the good choice usually. But if I fail it, then I'll get unlucky. Um, every time I test my luck and I succeed, my luck lowers by one. Right. And there are ways in the game to raise my luck back to or back up. You can gain more luck, but you can never gain past your maximum amount. And you can also use luck to do more damage or to mitigate damage yes, in fighting. during battles. Yeah. I can I can test my luck during battle, and I can do like an extra two points of damage or take... But if I test my luck in battle, and I screw it up, then if I'm doing it to do more damage, then I actually only do one damage. And then we'll explain combat when we get there, but yeah. Testing your luck does have... it. I can screw it up if I get I got I do like the mechanic of the sort of the, the, the pushing your luck the way it like, it like goes down as you use it. Yeah. It's yeah, kind of I think that's it. the best thing about this game, is like it just like they the some of the decisions I make you make, but uh, oh you you can oh we're gonna roll you can take the duct tape off the or the tape off the table by the way or the just the roll of tape the oh tape. yeah let's get rid of that all right uh, okay so you ready for some flavor text mm. so the back of the book this is usually what we start with are you brave enough to face the savage demons of the underworld? Evil stalks the land as undead hordes rise from their graves to terrorize the living. Embark on an epic quest from Moonstone Hills to the shadowy streets of Port Black Sand, to the depths of Darkwood Forest, and ultimately face your worst nightmare. Hmm. Wow. Okay. Cool. It's, it's long. You're gonna be so. It's not. This is not just like you're hanging out in one castle the whole time. No. Apparently. This is like I'm gonna be traveling around. This book like looks bigger than the other ones, but I mean, Paul says that there, there's a, these books cap off at 400 different kind yeah, of selections. Yeah, I, I don't know for whatever reason to do with how they set the books up. There are only ever 400 things. So yeah. if the book is longer, that just means that the descriptions are longer, I guess. Yeah. Or th there's less ones that are like, <clears throat> you turn the corner, turn to page 35. Yeah, some of them are just <laughs> real short, right? So okay, uh, let's roll our character before we get into the background because there's always like a background blurb yeah as you so said. let's roll our skill so we roll one die we add six to it that's our skill score obviously we want to roll a six doesn't always happen but we're gonna see oh. ah this game's so easy <laughs> this game's so easy Oh, yeah. 12 skill, baby. We're taking every fight. All right, let's go. All right, roll both dice. Add 12. That's our stamina. So this is health. Yeah. Eight. 20. It's pretty good. It's not too bad. And then our luck. We roll one die. Add six. And that's our luck. Boom. A lemon. I mean, that, that, that seems perfectly reasonable. Yeah, it's completely reasonable. This, this, uh, guy's yes. just, this, guy's, this guy's just you, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's just me. Yep. I'm always lucky seven. Yeah, no. Well, to be fair, winners make their own luck, Paul. Oh, that's true. And I'm a winner. So. Yeah, yeah. What some people view as luck, 
I, see. I have worked it's, very hard to get. And it, it's just it's just looking for the right opportunities. Yes, exactly. It's maybe, maximizing your opportunities. Exactly. That's all it is. Okay. All right. There's a map here. I wish I could show it to you. I guess you can't really. Uh, can you see the map? Yeah. Oh, Overhead, yeah. yeah, there's a map. Uh, there's a lot of places. I'm, I'm assuming we don't go to near more than three of them. The three they mentioned on the back of the book is probably the three we go to. <laughs> but there's a lot of places here, so excellent world building. All right, uh, let's get this show on the road. You ready? Twitch chat slash YouTube slash everybody else. All right, get comfy, kids. <sighs> Our adventure begins. All right. So this is the pre-first page. Thing. Yeah, this is the this is the world building aspect. This is setting up. This is giving me my motivation, both as an adventurer and as a game master. All right. Chalice is an affluent town on the north bank of Silver River, a wide, twisting river which flows gently down from the Moonstone Hills to merge with Catfish River on its way to the Western Ocean. It began as nothing more than a merchant store. Built at the built at the end. Uh, uh, geez, I can't read this. It began as nothing more than a merchant store built at the end of a wooden jetty used by river traders to land their goods. At first, trade was very slow, and the merchant complained he'd been handed a poison chalice. <laughs> Why is that your first complaint? Why don't you take responsibility for your actions? Maybe your business sucks. Yeah. You ever maybe, think about that? Maybe read, uh, you know, figure out what your market is. Yeah, it's like... Do some research. Yeah. It's like, it's like this chalice is poison. That's why my business sucks. It's like, yeah, I guess. It's, sure. it's the customers that are wrong. <laughs> yeah. Trade slowly improved, but the name stuck, and over time, chalice grew to become a busy river port. They, they dropped the poison part of it. Yeah. They were like, yeah. Like, we'll welcome to the town of poison chalice. <laughs> No favor wants to come to our town. <laughs> Chalice's inhabitants are mostly human, and it is also home to a number of other races. Welcome to Poison Chalice. We're mostly human. <laughs> there are elves, who always seem to know more about what's going on than anybody else. Striders, who run around town on their spindly long legs doing errands. Oh, it's me. Man orcs, who are usually hired as guards. Gnomes who spend most of their time slurping down bowls of pea soup. <laughs> two beefy ogres. Two. Two beefy ogres. <laughs> who hire themselves out to do most of the heavy lifting jobs. And an unusually friendly cyclops, who arrived one day long ago with goods to trade and never left. He acquired the nickname of Psy, became a blacksmith, and quickly built a reputation as the best smithy in Chalice. He later turned his skills to crafting the finest swords in northern Northern Alan Alangia? Alangia. Yeah, we're gonna go with Alangia. But never made more than one a month, says he refused to compromise on quality. Sai proudly sells his famous one eye swords for 50 gold pieces each. Uh, quality price for a quality product, as he says with gusto to his customers, and he is never short of those. What is this world? This is really random. Like, why are they being so specific? There's a Cyclops, but he only makes one sword a month. That sword is 50 gold. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, okay. I remember I... this. It may come <laughs> yeah. up later. This can be in the Cyclops test. Cyclops is like, I wish to sell you this this sword. Give me a price. <laughs> yeah, it's 50 if gold. If you do the wrong number, I will kill you. Yeah. He eats you. Commerce is the main reason for Chalice's prosperity. Merchants arrive from all over Al Al Alantia. Why am I having Alantia? To sell their wares in the town, where prices are always at a premium. Vendors pack the market square six days a week selling weapons, armor, potions, lotions, herbs, spices, grain, livestock, semi-precious stones, jewelry, silk, furs, fine textiles, and exotic foodstuffs. Money changes hands from dawn till dusk in brisk trading. Although Chalice has its fair share of impoverished folk, it, it affords nobles, merchants, landlords, and innkeepers a fine living. And like any large town with wealthy inhabitants, Chal Chalice also attracts pickpockets and thieves, who see the opportunity to relieve some of the more naive townsfolk of their hard-earned silver and gold. Young con artists learn their devious skills in Chalice, spinning yarns and practicing their scams on the locals. If they don't get caught, the best of them journey downriver to try their luck on the citizens of Port Blacksand, 
where they must compete with hardened professional thieves and vagabonds. Jeez. You, that's me, are a seasoned adventurer, an experienced sword for hire who enjoys slaying monsters and finding treasure above anything else. Despite some memorable, memorable adventures... They know you, you so well. You have learned the hard way that treasure hunting does not always guarantee the reward of glittering gold. More often than not, treasure hunters come back from their expeditions empty-handed. And when things don't go well, adventurers reluctantly have to resort to working for others, usually earning a low wage guarding rich nobles' estates or protecting merchants' caravans on their journeys to market. You recently arrived in Chalice, tired and hungry after spending a month scouring the pagan plains, trying but failing to find the buried treasure horde of Throm, the notorious axe-wielding barbarian who, rumor has it, died in Baron Succumbit's infamous death trap dungeon in Fang, trying to win the grand prize of 10,000 gold pieces. So that's the book. Yeah, see, editor, see Death Trap Dungeon. Yeah, Death Trap Dungeon is one of the books. I, I think we're going to do that one eventually. But Right, so this is... I guess the the idea here is there's going to be like there there may be refer lots of references to other I yeah. guess theoretically all of the or at least a j good chunk of the fighting fantasy books occur in the same world. Yeah, they're all in like the same umbrella kind of. Your days spent in Chalice have been anything but enjoyable. Unable to find work, you are forced to sleep rough in alleyways, scavenging for scraps of food, left abandoned by traders in the market square at the end of the day. It is a warm evening on day four of your stay. The sun is slowly sinking in the western sky, and the light is beginning to fade. You are standing outside the Fat Frog Inn, drooling over the menu nailed to the oak door, when two men stagger outside arm in arm. One is middle-aged, bearded, and wearing a brown leather tunic over dark green leggings, whilst the younger one is wearing a checked woolen shirt, tucked into his baggy brown pants. Both men are giggling like children, very much the worse for the amount of ale they have drunk. They brush past you, oblivious to everything. The younger man is hiccuping and swaying erratically from side to side. He tries to grab hold of the, hold of the back of a wooden bench to steady himself, but misses it and falls over, cursing. This causes his friend to laugh even louder. The young man sits up, squinting at the bright light, his mouth hanging open like a gormless fool. Eric, the younger man splutters, hiccuping. What? Stop laughing at me. Why? Jeez, this is a really long intro. <laughs> I think I figured out why this book is longer than the yeah. other ones. <laughs> because I'm going to be rich. Shut up, the older man replies dismissively. I am. I'm going to be rich. I bought a treasure map, he retorts, reaching into his pocket to produce an old piece of parchment as evidence. Too drunk to notice that he's holding it upside down, he stares at it with a befuddled expression on his face. Although you're well within earshot, you pretend not to be listening. How much did you pay for it? Four copper pieces? Four copper pieces? What a fool you are. There's not a hope that it's genuine. You've been done, Gregor, the older man says, laughing even louder. Stitched up like a kipper. A fool chasing fool's gold, that's what you are. You just don't learn, do you? You can't believe anything anyone says at the Fat Frog Inn. But, but the old man seems so genuine. He had an honest face, unlike all those other sharks and villains in this, there giving it large. I wanted to believe him. I did believe him. Are you going to go back in and get your money back? Nah, the poor man needed the money. He sounded desperate. I felt sorry for him. That's why I bought the map, really. No hard feelings. <laughs> this, this, <laughs> this guy came to terms with this. I got swindled. Ah, he so needed good. the money. <laughs> I feel like that guy was playing his own fi like fighting fantasy book. It was like, yeah. can you take the thing from the guy? <laughs> the oh, yeah, sure. Yeah, why not? I'll do yes. That. Uh, I enjoyed listening to his tale about the iron chest filled with golden amulets. He said it was hidden deep inside a cave in Moonstone Hills, and he kept going on about a gold ring in that chest. Said it was more valuable than all the amulets put together. What did he call it again? The ring of... Oh, fiddle. I can't remember now, but it doesn't matter if it's true, or you say it isn't true, or whatever. Forget about it, Gregor. He made it all up. The Ring of Burning Snakes. That's what he called it. Oh, that's not good. <laughs> that's what he called it. Snakes he said, but on fire. <laughs> he, he, he said it used to belong to an old wizard called Nico or Nico something or other. He said the wizard would pay a pretty penny to get it back. 
I said forget about it, Gregor. Come on, get up. Let's try the sun in next. I'm thirsty, Eric says sternly, pulling his friend up from the ground. All right, all right. I won't be needing this then. <laughs> He's just gonna throw the... Uh... <laughs> ah, don't eat this! <laughs> oh my god, that's amazing. Well, I'm just... <laughs> Might as well be an adventure hook for somebody else. Yeah, there's an adventurer that might use this. Okay. All right, all right. I won't be needing this then, Gregor says, crumpling up the parchment into a ball and tossing it over his shoulder before staggering off. The parchment ball lands just by your feet. Intrigued, you bend down to pick it up. You unfold it to reveal a very detailed, hand-drawn map of the land surrounding Chalice. The map shows a dotted line heading north from Chalice, then east, some way south of Darkwood Forest, crossing the eastern plain to Moonstone Hills, where a large X marks the entrance to a cave in Skull Crag, one of the highest peaks in the range. There is a message in tiny handwriting, written in black ink, on the back of the map which says, Do not enter by the cave entrance. Climb the crag to a ledge 20 meters above. Move the standing branches aside to reveal the secret entrance. Enter here and turn left, right, right at the junctions. Oh crap. <laughs> An iron chest will be found in the crystal cave. Good luck, Murgat Sure. You want, do you, you want to write that down oh, somewhere? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm write that down. Okay, ledge. 20 meters. Because they're going to be like, which ledge do you take? The one at 10 meters? No. Or the one at 20 meters? I'm like, oh, 20 meters, baby. Uh, okay. You buy a map. Move branches. And someone's like, no, that map won't work. And you're like, yeah, you're probably <laughs> right. <laughs> What about this this message on the back giving detailed instructions doesn't mean anything. Yeah. Uh, who you needs must this? Have just made it up. Yeah. Move branches and then left. Right. Right. Crystal cave. Iron chest, because there could be three chests. Yeah. Like which chest do you open? Oh, left, right, right. L R R. Oh yeah. Hmm. Very nice, good. Nice. Thanks. Thanks for the shout out, Ian Livingston. It's about time. Wow. Could a treasure chest really lie hidden in a cave inside Skull Crag? Why would an old man sell his secrets for a few copper pieces? Yeah, you're right. You, you should just throw the map away. <laughs> yeah. That'd be so good. <laughs> anyway, this adventure is about like a dragon or something. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they just give me... I this This adventure throws this away and then the Perspective shifts to another hungry adventure who's watching. You're like, oh, well, I got nothing to lose, right? Uh, and who is Murgat sure? Nothing makes sense. You were about to toss the map away. What? <laughs> you were about to toss the map away when you hear the shrill squawk of a bird overhead. You look up to see a crow flying north. Could it be an omen? Could this be your lucky day after all? You decide you have nothing to lose and everything to gain. You fold up the parchment and put it safely away in your pocket. Tomorrow you will set off for Skull Crag. But right now, you need to find some food and somewhere to sleep before nightfall. So, just to be clear, uh, a literal treasure map getting thrown at your feet yes. is not enough of an omen. Nope, the bird is the but, omen. <laughs> but a crow flying in the sky, yeah. you're like, oh, well, if there's a crow... Damn. Yeah, me at my lowest point, hungry and destitute. This treasure map showing up can poss not possibly be an omen. <laughs> but that bird, ah, the bird. This is, this is the equivalent of you know these days, like in the modern day, like basically like a lottery ticket, just like yeah, flowing, like flying. This is the, the fantasy air equivalent and, of a lottery ticket and landing at your feet, and you'd be going like, eh, this is probably <laughs> not a one that works. Yeah. I'll just throw it away. Yeah. Not everything happens for a reason, okay? <laughs> That's all I'm saying. All right, here we go. You fail to find any food and resign yourself to sleeping on some old flour sacks left outside a baker's shop at the end of an alley. You place your blanket on top of the sacks and lie down as darkness falls, ending the day exhausted and very hungry. You hear a dog sniffing nearby, but eventually fall asleep Dreaming of treasure chest overflowing with gold pieces and diamonds. He clearly said there are apparently amulets and uh, rings. Yeah. Ring of burning snakes. Yeah. 
A so, chest full of amulets. Yeah. Seems kind of weird to me. It's a weird, it's a very oddly specific thing to have yeah. a chest full of, right? Like, well, where else am I going to put my amulets? Like, it's the chest amulet. Everybody knows that. Then why is the ring in the chest? I'm like, no more questions. Do you have <laughs> Do you have so many amulets that you have nowhere to store them? Yeah. Reality returns early the following morning when you are rudely awoken, not long after sunrise by the sound of cockerels crowing loudly. The air is chill, but the skies are clear. At least another fine day is in store. You grab your trusty sword, roll up your blanket, and check the few belongings you have in your backpack. They don't amount to much. And these are all bolded. I like, guess you can you read. might want to write these down on your Yeah. Uh, a ball of twine. Twine. Candle. Okay. Obligatory you know take candle joke. Small brass bell. Okay. I don't know why we have a bell, but a lantern. A knife. <laughs> a knife! <laughs> Piece of chalk. Okay. Piece of chalk. A brass owl. <laughs> We're not gonna like, like sell the brass. I don't know. There's somebody's gonna buy this. Why am I starving when I have all this stuff? And there, there's like general adventurer gear. You know, you got your your twine and knife, chalk, blah de blah. Yeah. And then a brass owl. <laughs> a length of rope. You know, the standard, useful for so many different things that you might come across. A bag of nails. Uh, an animal skin water flask. Okay. And a goblet bearing a unicorn head motif. Okay. It's just weird. Like it feels like this is like stuff yeah. that you would that you're going to be picking up along your journey. Like like sell the owl to just start with a bunch of weird yeah. random gear. I guess I guess the whole idea is you're an adventurer. Adventurers pick up weird stuff. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh, the poison chalice. Yeah. yeah. Easy. Simple. All right. You make your way to the town square and fill your flask with water which flows from the spout of a fountain carved in the shape of a dragon's head. After quenching your thirst, you search through a pile of rubbish and find some squashed tomatoes and a chunk of bread left to rot in a wooden crate. The bread is stale, but right now a tomato sandwich seems like the breakfast of champions. <laughs> Add one stamina point. Oh, but, sick. But you're full yeah. stamina, aren't you? I think you can go above your maximum with stamina. Oh. I think, right? Can you? Also, wait, don't you start with like 10 days worth of rations? Yeah. <laughs> so why are we <laughs> I didn't think about that. We start with 10 days of food. I forgot about that part. Why are we digging through the garbage? Why are we so hungry? I'm pretty sure we start with provisions. Oh. No, my salmon my So wait! You start at max health, but why do they give you a health right off the bat? The literal first thing in the thing, there's no way you could possibly have... You can't go above... Yeah, you can't go above your max health. He's just, he's just toying with you. I get... <laughs> okay. I want to make sure that we start with these provisions. Stamina and provisions. You start the game with enough provisions for 10 meals. So why is our character digging through the garbage? Apparently... Uh, on the wiki for the book, that is an error in the the, the fact that you eat the that you get one stem. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, okay. That is a known error. Okay. You think it's literally the first thing? You think they could have proofread that far at least? <laughs> <laughs> it was the first thing they wrote, Paul. Why yeah. would you double check the first thing you wrote? Yeah, it's true. The sandwich takes the edge off your hunger, but you know you could eat more. There is nobody about except for a tall, middle-aged man with curly brown hair who is whistling happily to himself as he sweeps the square with a long broom. A leather shoulder bag is slung over his back. If you want to talk to him, turn to 19. If you'd rather leave the market square, turn to 58. I mean, this guy's just doing his job, minding his own business. I don't have to bother this dude. I'm going to ignore him. I'm not going to talk to him. Yeah, 58. There are three streets by which you could leave. Uh, sorry, there are three streets by which you could leave the Market Square. Will you head west down Silver Street, head north down Armory Lane, or head east down Beggar's Alley? So what did the map say again? 
All right, did you get a... You got a potion, too, didn't you? Oh, yeah. I have to choose a potion. I think potion of luck is always just generally the best one. I'm going to take the potion used of luck. for so many different things? Yeah, because luck, the puck, luck potion like completely restores your luck. Right? Oh, okay, rather than just giving you like one dice worth or something. I think it, that's how all the potions work. They just restore whatever mm. your attribute is, but I think luck is like the best one. Okay, uh, let's go to... Oh, I should write this down. Right, because provisions will restore your health anyway, so there's no point in having a potion for that. Yeah. Let's go page eight. Oh, hey. Por Potion of Fortune adds one point to the player's luck score and then restores player's luck to this new initial level. Oh, really? Is that how that works? This? Oh, yeah. Yeah, the Potion of Fortune is way better. Yeah. I... So the implication. So I can go to twelve. I can get like when I use my luck, and then I'll go. I'll drink the potion, go to twelve, and restore everything. Because I have eleven luck. So I think your luck just starts at twelve now. Like your like twelve is your max luck now. No, I have to drink it. Like I have the potion on me. The potion of fortune. Oh, I see. Right. You pick one of those three to start. I guess just holding the potion doesn't. Yeah, po sure. holding this potion doesn't do anything. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. All right. Let's go to turn to page eight. Sorry, that was... Uh... Armory Lane is only 100 meters long, but every building in it has been turned into an armorer's shop. All the shop windows are protected by thick iron grills to stop anybody breaking in and helping themselves to all the weapons and armor on display. There are swords, cleavers, spears, picks, pikes, axes and pole axes, clubs, maces, warhammers, helmets, body armor, and shields of every shape and size on display. All of the shops are closed bar one, which has a door almost twice the height of the other doors on the street. <gasps> it's the Cyclops' shop. Mm. There is an open sign on the iron-battered oak door. A small sign in the window reads, We have your size at size. You peer through the window, but do not see anybody inside. If you want to go into the shop, turn to 384. If you'd rather walk to the end of Armory Lane, turn to 33. Oh, we're definitely going in. 384, baby. Let's go say hi to a Cyclops. I like the idea that this is that thing in like JRPGs or whatever where you like start out and there's like a ton of awesome equipment that you can't get. Yeah. And like, yeah, yeah. it's like 10,000 gold pieces, please. He did say 50 gold pieces mm. for I, one of his you, good swords. You have no money, right? You have no gold right now. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I wouldn't be surprised if the, this game was like, you reach in your pocket, you have 50 gold on you. Oh, look at that. Yeah. He's like, yeah, this costs 50 gold or a brass owl. <laughs> yeah. I really like owls, yeah. Shelves behind the shop counter are filled with gauntlets, helmets, axes, daggers, and arrows, and the walls are covered with shields. Plate and chainmail suits of armor stand against the white hand wall. There is a glass case standing on the left side of the counter in which a magnificent sword is displayed, probably the finest you have ever seen in your life. The wide doorway behind the counter has a chainmail curtain which is suddenly pushed aside by a hairy hand the size of a large ham. An enormous one-eyed creature steps through the curtains to stand behind the counter, leaning in on it with its massive hands. Can I help you? The Cyclops says with a smile, revealing a row of sharp spiked teeth. You point at the display case and ask if the sword is for sale. I'm sorry, this is one eye. This, or sorry, I'm sorry, this one eye is sold in a waiting collection. I could put you down for a new one if you would like to leave a deposit of 25 gold pieces. It should be ready in about three years. If that is too long for you to wait, might I suggest you buy one of my demon daggers for 10 gold pieces? Will you buy the demon dagger, attack the Cyclops to get the sword, leave the shop, and walk to the end of the armory lane? I, See, a coward would I mean, leave. I mean, you have... Like, you don't have any gold, right? Like, the theoretically, the game should... The book should know at this point that you have no gold, yeah, right? Like, yeah. There's nowhere you could have gold. They would have no gold. But what if I just attack the Cyclops? Mm -hmm. With do. my 12 skill. Could do. Could do. I could. But I do have 12 skill. But this might just be an instant death thing. The Cyclops grabs you, kills you. Like, I mean, he I can't risk a 12 skill Otaku Jeff, okay? I might re roll into a 7 skill Otaku Jeff. And I don't think I can handle that. He does have ham hands. Yeah, they specifically state he has a ham hand. I'm going to try 195 anyway, just to see what happens. 
Like, I'll try to buy something. And I'd be like, okay. Because I had no money, right? I'm broke. Doesn't make any sense. Oh. But, okay. Well, you can't, you I don't think I can do this, so I don't want to do it. Because it just says you buy the dagger. Yeah. It's like, but game, I don't have any money. So but there must be other ways. There must for be you ways to, get... to like loop back. Yeah. All right. All right. Okay. Well, we're gonna ignore we did that because it just we don't have money. So it's uh. 384. So it's either I can fight them or I can leave. So Count. back to three eighty four. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we're back to three eighty four. We might have been able to got get money from the dude we ignored, but. Yeah, I'm gonna be. I'm not gonna attack him. I'm not gonna risk it, dude. Thirty-three. There is a timber yard at the end of Armory Lane where you see a stocky ogre in a grubby shirt and brown crop pants loading oak beams onto shelves, while a man in a thick jacket counts the number of beams on each shelf. The yard is formed by tall buildings backing on backing on to each other on three sides. And the only way in and out is via Armory Lane. The man turns to you and says, what can I do for you? If you want to talk to him, turn to 334. If you'd rather go back to the Market Square and walk down Beggar's Alley, turn to 283. I'll talk to him. 334 sounds... You walk up to the man and introduce yourself. He looks you up and down and says dismissively, you look like you need a job. I'll pay you two gold pieces to help Olaf load these shells. It shouldn't take more than two hours. If you want to accept the job offer, turn to 240. If you'd rather go back to Market Square and walk down Baker's Alley, turn to 283. So we're like looking for part-time work. We're just eating. We have a bunch of food on us already. And you literally, you have a treasure map that you aren't like, you're like, eh, we'll just wander around town. A little yeah. Bit. Yeah, I'll try working. Sure. Take two gold. I mean, I'm not working. My character is working. I guess technically I'm working right now, but. <laughs> the owner of the timber yard leaves after a few minutes, and you are left alone with Olaf the ogre. You ask him some questions, but he doesn't reply. You give up trying to talk to him and carry on piling beams onto the shelves. The owner comes back an hour and a half later, by which time you have finished loading the shelves and are quite exhausted. Lose one stamina point. Fiddle six. That'd be like some downside. I yeah. Think. He walks up to you and says with a smirk on his face, well done, you can go now. You ask him for payment and he looks at you quizzically and says, payment? What payment? Aww. The ogre sidles up alongside him, grinning, brandishing an oak club. If you want to fight the ogre, turn to 113. Oh, I'm definitely fighting this ogre. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, we're fighting. We're trying to rip me off? Do you know who I am? Taku Jeff. Fighting this ogre. The ugly ogre is a powerful and very vicious opponent. It is skilled at using a wooden club as a weapon and swings it forcefully through the air. It has a skill of 8 and a stamina of 10. That's a pretty good skill. It'd be a shame if somebody... Do you just have, like, a dagger? Like, what do you actually... No, I got a sword. They you say do... you have a trusty sword. Oh, you do? Okay, yeah. yeah. Um, okay, so it's got a skill of 8. So the way combat works is I roll 2d6. I usually have the monster go first. You roll 2d6, add their skill, and then I roll 2d6, add my skill. Higher number wins. Um, on a tie, nothing happens. You just uh, boink off each other. Yeah, and then if I beat whoever wins the combat, does two points of damage to the other person. Right. Um, and then if you use luck, you can do three or one, depending on Yeah, that. depending. So if I, if I win the combat, and then I want to choose to push my luck, I can push my luck to do... Th I think it's four damage, actually. You do double. You do four damage. But if I push my luck and I fail, then I only do one damage. Mm. And the same goes for if I take damage, I can push my luck, bump the damage down to one. Or if I am unlucky, then I take you double take damage. four? Yeah. Yeesh. All right. So, the ogre goes first. This is, uh, the ogre rolls a 15. I roll a 16. So, ogre takes two points of damage. Ogre! Wow, 17. Okay. Me, 17. Cool. 12 skill, baby. 
Yeah, ogre goes uh, twelve. I can't be. I can beat that no matter what. Yeah, you, yeah. you can't lose. So ogre takes two. Ogre goes six. Fourteen. I win. Man, what's it like to be watching actual sword swordmaster Otaku Jeff effortlessly cleave his way through? Oh. An 18. Okay, I my turn. <laughs> I should just I should be better at stating in whose turn it is. I have to be an 18. 19. A suck it. I feel like the the ogre like is flipping through his funny fantasy <laughs> book and then like, oh yeah, I can take this guy. No problem. <laughs> Flips the page. 12 well, skill! 12 skill. <laughs> oh crap. <laughs> okay. Ogre goes. Uh ogre gets a 15. I go. I get a 16. All right, sick. I win. I beat the crap out of this ogre. Well. Okay. Combat's one, not the allure of this, okay? One of the two ogres in town is now dead. <laughs> oh, yeah! This, <laughs> we've just cut their population in half. Yeah. <laughs> oh, jeez. I'm going to find the other one and kill it, too. That's my new goal. All right. I'm going to find both ogres. So you, you took no damage there, right? No, didn't take any damage. Nice. Turn to 179. 12 skill just makes this game, like, incredibly easy. I mean, that's compensated for by the, you know, the ways you can mess, oh, you yourself, can just you can mess yourself like... up without fighting. Yeah. Uh, 179. So... This is over. Okay. A search of the ogre yields five copper pieces and an iron key, which it was wearing around its neck on a piece of string. Uh, five copper... It says gold, but I mean, like, okay. Iron key. Okay. Are, if this is the D and D style, it's like decimal currency. Yeah. So. For five ten, copper is so a hundred. You need a hundred copper for. You need a hundred copper for one gold. And then ten silver for one gold. And then, yeah. Yeah. All right. Uh, you pocket the coins and the key, and turn in the timber. Or turn to the timber yard owner, who steps backwards, afraid that you might attack him. He apologizes profusely and begs you not to harm him, offering you ten copper pieces and three gold pieces in payment for having treated you so badly. You snatch the coins from him and walk back down the armory lane to the market square and on to Baker's Alley. Turn to 283. Or, if you have not done so already, you may go back to Market Square to go to Silver Street. Turn to 104. You haven't gone to... So I have 15 copper and three gold. Yeah, you haven't gone to Silver Street yeah. or Baker's Alley. Uh, let's go to Silver Street. 104. Silver Street is a narrow cobbled street lined with small houses and shops, most of which are jewelers and silversmiths. These are, there are beautifully crafted silver teapots, urns, platters, and condiment sets on display in the window of the silversmiths. The second shop has a sign above the shop window which says, Jethro's Jewels. A white-haired old man wearing a white shirt and a black apron is placing gold jewelry and ornaments in the window. He looks up, smiles, and beckons you to enter his shop, hoping that you might be his first customer of the day. You pop your head through the door and see a tall man-orc standing near the jeweler, who is this hired guard. If you want to enter the jeweler's shop, turn to 275. If you'd rather keep on walking to the end of the street, turn to 82. There's a picture, too. Yeah. If you scroll up. Is that him? Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's him. That's actually. Oh, you have the actual. Yeah, I've got the same edition. Oh, you got the same. Oh, edition, well, well there's no, there's no old edition, right? Right. We, yeah, we. T that's what we talked about. There's yeah. no old edition. Sell what's, him our brass what's, owl. What's the difference between an orc and a man orc? Uh, this one's more man than orc. Hmm. I guess. Right. Think like or less like, like Lord of the Rings orcs and more like World of Warcraft are orcs. There, are there also lady orcs? I would assume so. There has to be. They're not hatched. Right? Ma orc. Ma, ma orc. <laughs> All right. Uh, do I want to go in? Yeah. What's the worst that could happen, right? We have to kill an orc? <laughs> Probably. We just pick a fight everywhere we go. Uh, 275. The brass ring rings, or the brass bell rings loudly as you push open the heavy door of the jeweler's shop. The man orc glares at you, 
suspiciously, his hand resting on the hilt of a sword in his belt. <laughs> Don't be concerned by Kresha. He won't hurt you unless you do something stupid like try to rob me, the old man says calmly. I see from your attire that you are not from these parts. Would you like to purchase something? Or perhaps you may have some treasure to sell me. You look at the glass cabinets as though interested in buying something, but there is nothing on display that you can afford. If you have a gold rabbit charm that you wish to sell, turn to 396. If you would rather leave the jewelers and walk to the end of the street, turn to 82. Well, we don't have a, a gold rabbit charm, so we have to turn to 82. Mm. Too good for your brass alley. Yeah. Silver Street ends at a T-junction where it joins a narrow cobbled street running north and south. It is lined with drab, narrow houses built of grey stone with small windows and high-pitched roofs. A horse-driven cart laden with rusty old iron, worn-out shoes and clothes, rotten wood, and bits of furniture rumbles down the street towards you. The pasty-faced driver is slouched in his seat in a threadbare coat and top hat, looking bored, occasionally flicking his horse with the long whip to urge it on. Rag and bone, he shouts out half-heartedly as he passes each house, hoping that someone might toss something out, of, out for him to take away. But nobody opens their door. There doesn't seem to be much happening in Barrel Street, will you? Stop the rag and bone man to talk to him. Walk back to the Market Square and go to Armory Lane. Walk back to Market Square and go to Baker's Alley. Uh, I'm going to talk to this dude. 326. I've discovered uh, it's real bad luck to be the first person Adam Savadan meets in any of these books. <laughs> Why? Well, oh, because I killed the. the you head. remember, like in in like the Warlock Firetop Mountain, there's yeah. like the guy in the in the prison cell, and you're like, yeah, I don't care about him. Yeah. In this one, there's like the the janitor guy, and you're like, yeah, I don't care about him. <laughs> Yeah, but then true. every single other person after that, you're like, oh, yeah. What oh, I mean, it happened guy? in Civil of Chaos, too. There was a dude like, help, and he was all hurt. And oh, I was yeah. Like, ah, yeah, 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 I yeah, pieced out of him. But it turned out that that guy was a vampire. Like, you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I was like, oh, well. Okay, the man eyes you suspiciously, wondering why you stopped him. I've got nothing worth robbing me for, if that's what you're thinking, he says in a tired voice. You reply that you are about to set off on a treasure hunt in Moonstone Hills and are just trying to collect some provisions before leaving Chalice. I wouldn't bother with Barrel Street, trust me, he says with a knowing look. For a copper piece, I'll take you to the main gates if you're ready to go now. Oh. I mean, I have a copper piece. Yeah, I mean... I, do yeah, you, I'm gonna... Do you, I'm, you haven't gone to Beggar's Alley yet? No. Nah, do you care? No. I'm going to 255. We're going to pay this dude a copper. Going to 14 copper. 255. This is the easiest ride. Hell yeah, take a ride. It's like when you're in high school and your friend, like you have that one friend who has like a license and they show up and they're like, yeah, you want to ride? I'm like, yes. <laughs> I'm like, I yeah. Care. I don't care where we're going. I was just eating tomatoes out of the garbage. Of course I want to ride. <laughs> Come on. Yeah. You're you ride in your, your friend's car that's full of bones and rags. Yeah, it's fine. All right. You climb aboard the cart and sit next to the driver who introduces himself as Eggert. Or oh, Egbert. Oh, Egbert. Egbert. It's a slow and bumpy ride over cobblestones as the cart wends through narrow streets of Chalice to the main gates. You give Egbert one copper piece, which he thanks you, for, thanks you for, saying, A few words of advice for you. There's somebody from Chalice who makes funny wooden boxes, which he hides in caves and the like. If you find one, be careful when you open it. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> Good luck on your adventure, stranger. You'll need it. You thank Egbert for the ride, jump down from the cart and walk through the gates, waving goodbye to him. Turn to 64. You mean a treasure chest, Egbert? Is that what we're talking about? Egbert. Ah, yes. Egbert. I... 64. So at some point, you're going to encounter, there's like, there's a wooden box. Do you open it carefully or <laughs> hastily? <laughs> you just said don't open it at all, right? He said, be careful when you open it. Oh, yeah. 64, right? God, I, keep, I don't know why I'm keeping track of this, but... You walk out of the main gates of Chalice heading north, looking back briefly at the town's rooftops and towers sticking out above the outer wall. You follow a well-worn path past a church ruin and ancient graveyard, and on 
past ca- scattered dwellings until you reach a farm where the path ends at the edge of a vast field of golden corn, the tall stems swaying solely from side to side in the gentle breeze. It's going to be a bumper crop, and good news for the farmers whose oxen will soon be hauling wooden carts through the field for their farmhands to load with cobs of corn. Looking north as far as you can see, way beyond the cornfield, you can just make out the top of a high wall of trees that marks the edge of Darkwood Forest, the vast forest that is home to the grand and sometimes grumpy old wizard Yaztromo. Hey! Yeah. Hey! These are all references we get. I don't think we ever ran into Yaztromo, didn't we? Then weren't we the apprentice of Yaztromo? Yeah, yeah. He was like your, yeah, he was your apprentice, or you were his apprentice. Yeah, was- that's, yeah. Okay. Who lives alone in his fabled tower. Many a tale and myth have come from Darkwood Forest, but you remind yourself that Skull Crag is your destination today. You look at your map and head east in the warm sunlight, eager to reach Moonstone Hills before nightfall. As you walk along the edge of the cornfield lost in thought, you suddenly hear the sound of galloping hooves and the shrill call of a hunting horn. If you want to face the rider coming towards you, turn to 263. If you'd rather hide in the cornfield, turn to 148. I mean, a coward would hide. But I mean, I'm this a ca- seems like a pretty straight, straight up, are you a coward or not? Yeah. Coward nice. it is. 148. I'm hiding, dude. I don't know how bad this game is. Look, I'm in the... Uh, I'm in the, the... I would not have guessed that. <laughs> Alright, 148, baby. You dive into the cornfield and wait to see who is approaching. The thundering sound of galloping hooves grows louder, and moments later you catch a glimpse of a horse's legs flashing by, heading west at full speed. Whoever it is on horseback is certainly in a hurry. You decide you might as well help yourself to some corn. <laughs> I mean, while I'm hiding here, I might as well eat. <laughs> You're like laying on the ground. Like, I picture my arms not even moving. My head just, like, tilts over and goes... Yeah, start eating your cob, yeah. <laughs> just raw corn. We have ten days of food, exactly. Our character's an idiot. All right. Add one stamina point. Yeah! We get back that stamina we lost to the stupid manual labor that we got tricked into. <clears throat> when you have finished eating, you set off again. You estimate it will be dark by the time you reach Skull Crag and hope you will be able to find somewhere safe to camp down for the night. Looking south, you see an old stone cottage with just the burnt edges of its thatched roof remaining due to a fire. If you want to take a look inside, the cottage turns 3 to 19. If you'd rather press on towards Moonstone Hills. Oh, I'm not pressing on. That's that's a death sentence. It's like, you travel into the night. You get jumped by a werewolf. The werewolf eats you. The problem is, you go into the cottage, you get jumped by a werewolf. <laughs> yeah. The werewolf eats you. Like, they're equally <laughs> likely. Yeah. But at least I die in a house, right? 319. <clears throat> Uh-oh. You open the rickety wooden door and walk inside cautiously, sword in hand. Looking at you with surprised expressions on their faces are two man-orcs sitting on stools eating rats with their hands. <laughs> they have dark green warty skin and are wearing light leather armor. They jump up and grab their short swords, snarling and flashing their spiked teeth and sharp tusks as they leap forward to attack you. Fight them one at a time. Skill five. No, oh, they only have five skill. They have to roll like liter. Okay. Well, yeah, they're in trouble. Yeah, they're in a lot of trouble. Okay, so the first one is five and six. So the orc attacks first. Oh, a nine, a fourteen. I win. Goes to yeah, four. They, have, they have to roll a ten to have any chance of actually hurting you. Oh, okay. Because yeah, like yeah. a nine, you can possibly tie them. Yes. Okay. And a ten, they have to roll a ten before they can actually hurt you. Okay. So let's just do it that way. Well, that's a nine. They can tie us, right? They can tie. Yeah. 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 They don't tie us. Goes to two. So the orc attacks. It dies. All right. The second orc. That's an eight. I don't think I can. No, I can't lose to that. He just takes four and dies immediately, right? Well, he's at. He takes two. Oh, right. Two, right. Orc goes. It dies. Man, having 12 skill is awesome. <laughs> so imagine if I had 7 skill, I'd have to actually play this game. <laughs> or I'd actually worry. You know what I mean? And yet... I think that's a better viewing experience, though. Like, if I just have, like, the lowest skill possible. But then again, like, I, I'm going to run into an adventure where, like, I have a low skill and I just die in a fight. And it's going to be awful. It's like, oh, that sucks. And yet, 
you still hidden the uh, cornfields when there's a rider coming. Yeah. Like a coward. <laughs> I got corn out of it. That's true. Who's the coward? I healed a stamina point, Paul. That's true. It's true. Would a coward heal stamina? Hmm? I mean, if you got it by hiding in a cornfield, then yeah, <laughs> yeah, probably. <laughs> mm, raw corn. All right. Uh, if you win, turn to 229. Well, I mean, they are just orcs, right? Orcs are like just a step up from goblins as far as threat level goes. I mean, these are man orcs. I don't know if they're that, that makes them scarier than regular it, orcs. I don't think it makes it any scarier. Yeah. Like, there's a tier list, right? I mean, goblins are the lowest. Then probably orcs. And then, like, ogres. Mm -hmm. And then trolls. Trolls are worse than ogres. Mm -hmm. Then, like, giants are worse than trolls. As far as, like, humanoids go. Yeah. Yeah. In Hero mm -hmm. Quest, there's, the, like, the Vermeers, too. Yeah. All right. Uh, the man orcs have leather pouches on their belts, which you empty out onto the floor. Like, I just... Nope. <laughs> My character is an idiot. <laughs> He's just the dumbest shit. <laughs> it's just like, oh, it's time to dump out all their stuff. Uh, you find a copper piece, seven teeth, a silver button, a glass eye, an arrowhead, and three polished stones. After taking what you want, all of it, yeah. seven teeth? I'm not just going to throw that away. Did, where was it? Was he carrying the seven teeth like in his mouth? No, they were in his <laughs> bag. So they weren't his teeth. No. I'm going to write this down over here just because my thing's right. It's weird they're not like copper bold, piece. bolded or whatever. Yeah. So we go up to a copper. Uh -oh. Seven teeth. Silver button. Glass eye. An arrowhead. I'm praying that they're like... Do you have seven teeth? Like, <laughs> you're in luck. <laughs> uh, three polished stones. I bet you those the stones have to be magical, right? They gotta be. It's just the way it works. All stones are magical. <laughs> Not poli polished stones are always magical. Why would they specifically state that they're polished? Huh? I don't know. Okay. Uh. After taking what you want, you look around the room to see if there's anything else which might be of use to you. There are five jars on a shelf containing rat's tails, small bones, worms, dead flies, and sheep's eyeballs. You have room in your backpack for one jar, but if you want to take more, you will have to leave something behind for each additional jar you take. In the far corner of the room, you discover a wooden trap door partly hidden by an old iron stove. If you want to move the stove to unbolt the trap door, turn to 130. If you'd rather leave the cottage and carry on towards the Moonstone Hill, Turn to 165. Jar squad, jar squad, jar gang, jar gang. Uh, I'm gonna take one jar. What do I take? You're not gonna. You're not gonna. You you want to keep all the other stuff you have? I don't ever know when I might eat any, any of this. You never know when I'll need a bag of nails. Mm. So I gotta take one jar. All right. Rats tails, small bones, worms, dead flies, sheep's eyeballs. Worms. I'm gonna take the jar of worms. All right. Jar of worms. It's going to be worms, and I'm going to get rewarded for this for once in my life. If I don't get rewarded for taking the jar of worms, this game is clear proof that bad things happen to good people. Okay? Sounds perfectly reasonable. <laughs> uh, yeah, I definitely want to try out this secret door that we found. 130. <clears throat> the trap door lifts up to reveal a narrow wooden staircase leading down into a dark cellar. There is a very unpleasant smell wafting up like rotten meat. You hear the sound of feet dragging along the floor below and a rasping guttural sound like a sickly death rattle. If you want to go down the steps to investigate, turn to 323. If you'd rather shut the trap door and leave the cottage to carry on towards Moonstone Hills, turn to 164. Well, as I've proven already in this playthrough, I'm not a coward. He never hides from anything, so we're going to 323. There's one entry in here that's like two pages long, and I keep on skipping over it. I'm like, oh, I don't want to do that one. <laughs> it's a long ass. It's like literal two pages. Okay. I wonder if those orcs knew they had like a zombie in their basement. I don't know. 
Who knows? I guess we're going to find out. With your sword drawn, you slowly descend the wooden stairway into the semi-darkness. You are about halfway down the steps when a sickly gray hand reaches out from the shadows and grabs your ankle. An unseen creature goes berserk, wailing loudly as it tries to bite your leg. You swing your sword blindly at your attacker. Test your luck. If you're lucky, turn to 199. If you're unlucky, turn to 287. So, testing your luck. We roll 2d6. We have to roll equal or under our luck. We have 11 luck. So, the only way we fail is if we roll a 12. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> is if we roll a 12. You Which, rolled we rolled an 11. Oh man, I saw the 6 and I was like, ooh, I saw the other, I thought that was two 6s. And I was like, oh man, I should stop talking. Whew. It's okay, we're good, we're yeah, good, we're good. good. You're good. You have to roll equal or under. So yeah. we lose a luck, we got lucky. 199. Your sword finds its mark, sinking into your attacker's shoulder with a dull thud. It makes a gurgling sound in its throat, but increases its grip on your ankle. The creature shuffles into the shaft of light shining down from the room above, and you see its pallid gray skin covered with festering sores. Its gaping mouth is torn, yeah, is torn away at one side to reveal broken black teeth and a lolling tongue, and its sunken eyes are red-rimmed and lifeless. Oblivious to the gaping wound on its shoulder, the zombie lurches forward trying to bite you. You must fight the undead creature. Skill five, stamina, or skill six, stamina five. So it has to roll. It's got to roll an eight in order to tie you. Yeah. So anything below an eight, we can just ignore. Yeah. So the zombie goes, it's a two, it loses two stamina. Zombie goes, it's a seven, it loses two stamina. Uh, zombie goes. Rolls a four. It dies. Oh. Made mincemeat of that zombie. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like my character is like a max level character who's shown up in like a low level zone. And it's just like, yeah, what's up? Whack, whack. <laughs> like, where's all your treasure at, stupid ogre? Like, <laughs> Apparently you min-maxed into like strength and not, you know. Smarts? Intelligence. Yeah. Or, or remembering. <laughs> Common sense. Yeah. yeah. High strength, low wisdom, low int. All right. The zombie corpse twitches, twitches on the cellar floor before finally coming to rest. Your eyes adjust to the gloom, and you see that the cellar has bare stone walls and no more than six, or, and is no more than six square meters in size. The words "Help me" are written in dried blood on one of the walls. There is also an arrow drawn in blood on the opposite wall, which points to a small crack in the wall. Suddenly, you hear footsteps from above. Somebody has entered the cottage and is walking across the floorboards towards the trap door. If you want to run up the steps to confront the unknown visitor, turn to 352. If you'd rather stay where you are, turn to 109. Huh. Yeah, well, is... me, never a coward. This is a very busy cottage. Yeah. It's like I just showed it. It's like somebody's house. Who killed my friends? <laughs> like, mom, dad? <laughs> like, uh, awkward. Uncle? Uh, le at least our cousin in the basement will be. Oh, <laughs> yeah. man. Is my pet zombie still alive? Oh no. Um, I'm gonna go to. Th I'm gonna confront. Three fifty two. You bound up the steps, sword in hand, to find yourself standing face to face with another man orc. It points at you and starts screaming and shouting in a language you don't understand. Picks up both swords lying on the floor and runs at you, intent on revenge. You must fight the man orc. There's so much combat in this one. You totally did kill his friends. Yeah, we did. He's like, what up? He was like, I was going out for... He drops the bag of groceries that he has in his hand. He's like, oh! <laughs> okay, uh, skill of six. The, like, three Slurpees he brought back. It's the same thing, right? If it rolls under a ten? Uh, no. I... It's an eight. It's an eight. Yeah. If he rolls under an eight, you don't even bother rolling. Yeah. So the orc goes... Six takes two points of damage. Orc goes. This guy's a little tougher than the oh, other one. Ten. Okay, sixteen. I attack. Seventeen. <laughs> Twelve skills, so dumb. All right. Uh, orc goes. It's a sixteen. I go. It's a lot. <laughs> Twenty-two. 
it dies a miserable death. So we butchered the two orcs, and then his friend showed up and was like, you killed my friends! And we butchered him too. Yep. Alright, if you win, turn to 210. <laughs> you you empty the man orc's pouch to find a piece of chalk, some dried nettles, and a tiny cast iron pig trinket. If you Yeah, maybe you should just like stay in this cottage and just keep yes. ganking people to come by. <laughs> it seems to be getting you a lot of stuff. <laughs> just waiting, like yeah. <laughs> So do we write down this stuff? I got two pieces of chalk. Two. I'm gonna write this down, dude. Dried yeah. nettles? Yeah. I mean, the weird thing is, can you now throw the, some of this stuff away to take more jars? No. That doesn't make any sense, but... Pig trinket. Okay. Uh... Okay. Uh... So there, there's down in the cellar, there's a thing that was like, help me, and there's an arrow to a crack in the wall. Yeah. Or you can examine the crack, or I can just leave. Well, I gotta, I gotta look at the crack. Like, what the hell what kind of psychopath do you think I am? I can't just ignore that. Two forty-four. You find a folded piece of paper jammed into the crack in the wall. You pull it out and go back up the steps to read what is written on it. It's a grim message, which must have been written by the person who turned into the zombie you encountered in the cellar. It tells you of his terrifying experience of being bitten by a zombie whilst mining for gold in Moonstone Hills. The other miners, fearing he might bite them, brought him to the ruined cottage and locked him in the cellar, leaving him to rot. It ends up an apology saying, if I attacked you, I'm sorry. <laughs> wow. uh, it was not of my own doing, but of the zombie I will have become. All that is mine now is yours. Look under the steps. If you want to go back down the cellar to look under the steps, turn to 3391. Oh, hell yeah. 391, baby. I love the idea of just like... It's a Canadian zombie. <laughs> well, I love the idea of a zombie like just as they're turning being like, oh, this is going to be bad. Yeah. And then just like hanging like a sign around his neck being like, <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry. sorry for this. <laughs> I like the idea of a Canadian zombie like, I'm sorry. Uh. <laughs> I just can't control myself. I can't control it. 391. I'm finding so much loot in this house. This is definitely worth it. Yeah, yeah. So I ate some corn and I found a bunch of stuff. And I killed a bunch of orcs. Mm. You find a small cloth bag nailed to the underside of one of the wooden steps. It contains a copper bracelet which has mysterious runes etched on it. If you want to put the bracelet on, turn 85. Oh my god. This is definitely a cursed item. There's no way it's not a cursed item. I mean, he was... If you're turning into a zombie, right? Yeah. And you're like, uh, oh, I'm really I'm gonna kill some people. Yeah. I'll feel really bad about that, but maybe I'll be able to make it up to them if they can kill me by giving them my most prized possession. Yeah. Would you have that thing be a cursed thing? Like Yeah. Ataka Jeff has been in town for an hour and murdered five people. To be fair, I was in town for only half of that hour. <laughs> I only murdered one person in town. And second of all, zombies aren't people, they don't have souls. Uh well, the soul's already gone. Yeah. They're not a person anymore. It's like a skeleton. Yeah. This guy was killed by a zombie like a while ago. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that person happened, was killed. He just happens to be still walking around, but he's been dead for a while. Yeah. Not your fault. You can't tell me that zombies have souls, Twitch chat. Okay? Um, I'm trying not to... It's really hard sometimes not to like read ahead. I know, you know whatever like happens on 392 is sweet. I don't know. I saw somebody in chat say that. I'm trying not to look at 392. So now don't. I don't know how to get there. Turn, though. turn to 85. Okay. You're going to put it on? Yeah, I'll put it on. I got to get away from that page so I don't read it. Quit spoiling me, Twitch chat. Okay. I'll ban you. Even worse, I'll get Paul to ban you. That's like the nicest person on the planet saying you can't talk here anymore. As soon as you slip the bracelet on your wrist, a strange tingling feeling runs through your body, which makes you lim your limbs feel numb and heavy. Uh-oh. It's a huge effort even to lift your arm or walk one step. 
The tingling sensation quickly subsides. Yeah! Leaving you feeling stronger than ever and full of energy. Gain one skill and two stamina. Ha ha ha! I don't think you can have any more skill. Like, I think that's... Like, it doesn't increase beyond your max, right? Uh, can't have 13 skill points. I don't think you can have 13 skill. I think Paul's right. <laughs> I'm checking the rules. The bracelet of power. Oh, it does go to 13? I guess it's like whether it's like increasing your value or healing you. Uh, it says, okay. Yeah, although you may receive additional skill, stamina, and luck points, these totals may never exceed your initial scores, except on very rare occasions when instructed on a particular page. So it doesn't tell me. So you think it would say, it would probably say like, even if. Yeah, even if this is not your max. Your maximum. It doesn't say that that it doesn't say that specifically because I remember running into that before. I think in the first book where it's like, it does seem weird that wearing a bracelet of power just like heals you a bit yeah. rather than it doesn't even like, heal me. I'm at max health. This bracelet well, yeah. literally does nothing for me. But if you were like, it seems like it should actually increase your abilities. But I don't know. it didn't sound like restore your skill. It says it increase your skill. skill you can lose skill points yeah i don't know if it's a magic item increase it all right i'm going with the twitch chat council on this one yeah all right but yeah you definitely can lose skill points yeah friggin uh leprechaun did something bad to you yeah recently. it buzzed us like yeah. it shook our hand all right well it is a bracelet of power like let's be honest here uh should write this down somewhere. I appreciate uh, the foresight of the guy turning into a zombie, taking off his bracelet of power before he turned into a zombie. Yeah. Like, Thanks, buddy. That's actually like super <laughs> nice of you. Good foresight. <laughs> real, real go getter. This, this zombie was. Yeah. Good foresight. All right. Uh, pleased to be wearing the bracelet of power. You leave the cottage and set off again to the Moonstone Hills. Turn to one sixty four. That was a good detour, dude. Got some teeth. We got a jar of worms. We got a bracelet of power. Yeah, and a bunch of other weird crap. Also some teeth. All right. I mean, I'm just going to go by what the viewers say, right? If you say it's an increased Twitch chat, then let's go with that. Whatever you think is going to be the most enjoyable viewing thing, especially when it you, rules in my favor. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know? You just... You, you, you're just saying teeth to get Twitch chat to... Oh, I didn't even think about that. <laughs> ah, yeah. Ah, only a couple of them said it. All right. Walking through the tall grasses of the eastern plain, you see the great expanse of the Moonstone Hills looming before you, with the foothills, foothills no more than half a day's walk away. To your left, the plain stretches north as far as you can see all the way to Darkwood Forest, and to the south, all the way to Silver River and beyond. You walk on determinedly, but looking at your map, you have a lingering doubt about its authenticity. <laughs> half an hour later, you see a flock of birds high in the sky circling above a building about a half a kilometer northeastwards. If you want to investigate, turn to 71. If you'd rather keep heading east, turn to 134. So our idiot character thinks every bird's an omen. Also, did, wait, didn't you go into the cottage in the first place because it was getting dark and you needed to rest? Yeah. Did you do that? No. Oh, we oh. killed a bunch of shit and we're like, well, time to go. <laughs> right. Yeah. We were seeking shelter, but then, nope. Oh, I'm going to go check out everything I can, so. 71. Birds only circle cool things. Okay. Uh, the building is a small wood cabin in front of which there are many rows of blueberry bushes blooming with plump, ripe fruit. There is a scarecrow wearing a straw hat tied to a wooden post in the middle of, of the rows of bushes, which seems to be keeping the birds at bay. If you want to take a closer look, turn to 358. If you'd rather continue your journey, well, we're going to take a closer look. You walk up. Oh, Scarecrow, gotta go. Gotta go, gotta go. <laughs> oh, I'm going to, like, hide and eat some blueberries. That's my character's thing. You hear a horse coming. It's like, you hide in the blueberries. Eat one. Okay, 358. Okay. 
As you approach the scarecrow, its head suddenly lifts, and you see it's not a man made of straw, but a live human being. A sinewy old man with a long beard and straggly hair wearing ragged clothing. Help! Help! He shouts desperately on seeing you. At the moment, the cabin floor door flies open and three blue-skinned goblin-like creatures run out, screaming at the top of their lungs. They are no more than a meter tall and are wearing red cotton jackets, red pointed hats, and red canvas shoes. They have large heads with long pointed noses and their wide mouths house sharp, jagged teeth and bright red tongues. Are these red caps? I think so. Their sunken, lizard-like green eyes glaring out from under their pointed hats give them a deranged look made all the worse by the sight of the big forks and long knives they are holding. They cackle maniacally as they run forward to stab you in the leg. If you want to fight the blue imps, turn to 226. If you want to make a run for it, turn to 116. We're a literal combat god. You want to show the picture of this? Oh, is there a... Yeah, there's art. Oh, no. That's them. They're just heads. They're just like head and mouth with legs. They're, they're like Easter Island goblins. <laughs> 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 226. Fight them, you coward. In what world do I not fight the blue imps? Uh, the blue imps may be small in height, but they are very quick and dexterous. Fight them one at a time. Skill 6. So... 15? They have to roll at least a 9? Oh, right. You're, you're at 15 now, right? No, I'm 13. Minimums I can roll is 15. The minimum you can roll is 15. Yeah. And their skill is 6. So right. they have to roll a nine, at least, to tie me. They have to roll a nine in order to tie you, yeah. yeah. All right, first imp. First imp goes. That's a 10. Okay, 16. Not bad. I roll maximum. <laughs> you just, like, shish kebab them. Yeah, okay. Imp goes. Eight. Can't kill me, or can't do anything. Takes two points. Imp goes a 10. Okay, 16. I go a lot. <laughs> that imp dies. Uh, next imp. Takes two points. Imp goes again. Takes another two points. That one dies because it only had four hit points. <laughs> I'm just butchering these imps. You just like have like all three on your sword at once. Yeah. Uh, first or the third imp goes. That's a 16. Okay. I rolled. A lot. I'm rolling really well tonight. The scarecrow guy is like, yay! <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Imp goes. That's an eight. It takes two points. Uh, imp goes. That's not good enough. All right. Cool. Mm, yeah, you just put the sword on frappe. <laughs> yes. Uh, turn to one ninety one. They have in their pockets. <laughs> yeah, it's like you turn the imps upside down to start pouring them out. The little old man lets out a huge cheer as you dispatch the last of the blue imps. Wonderful! Wonderful! He shouts out happily at the top of his voice. I'm saved! I'm saved! You untie the ropes binding him to the post and he starts jumping in the air with excitement. You ask him how he ended up becoming a human scarecrow. This is going to be good. Those damned imps, he says angrily. I was on my way to Deedlewater a week ago and had camped down for the night. I was asleep when they crept up into my camp and kidnapped me. They bound my wrists and ankles and brought me here hanging from a pole carried by two of the little rascals. That was not an enjoyable experience, I can tell you. They are so short, I kept bumping my head into the ground. Well, it only got worse, didn't it? They plonked me here in the middle of their blueberry bushes and said that unless I scared the birds away, they would eat me. Carnivores, that's what they are. Can you imagine those horrible little creatures with their knives and forks slicing me up? There's hardly any meat on me. Why would they bother? They'd be better off eating the blooming blueberries, but they don't. They grow the blueberries just to make a special dye which they rub on their skin to make it turn blue. I love eating blueberries myself, which reminds me, I'm starving. The old man begins cramming handful after handful of blueberries into his mouth. You follow his lead and gorge on the tasty berries until you can't eat any more. Add two stamina points. Well, I'm going to say that since yeah, it's not a magical item. It's just like food, yeah. Mm -hmm. Finally, he, let, he lets out a satisfied loud burp and asks you where you're headed. And you reply that you're on, you're on your way, you were on your way to Moonstone Hills on a quest. He lets out a low whistle and says, 
Well, a bit of advice for you then, before I go. If you are thinking of sleeping out here on the plane, make sure you build a fire to keep away the hungry critters roaming around at night. And since you are going to be exploring caves, here's a lump of stickle wax in case you get bitten by a gronk. <laughs> I don't know what either of those things are, but thanks. <laughs> it's not a sense. Here's some stickle wax. Don't get bitten by a gronk. Oh, God. Imagine if just like later on in the book. Yeah. You were, it was just like <laughs> in the darkness, a gronk eats you. If you have the stickle wax, wax yeah. that's <laughs> like the to page ten. That's like running into the prompt of like if you have the spider in the jar with the human face, like you're like what? <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, stickle wax, Gronk. Just rub it on the bite, and you'll be fine. Now I must be on my way to Deedle Water. My wife will be wondering what happened to me. He shakes your hand and wishes you luck. You watch him gather up some blueberries before heading off. If you want to look inside the Blueham's cabin, turn to thirty-eight. If you'd rather carry on to Moonstone Hills, turn to one thirty-four. Yeah, we are definitely going to check out. Cabins have been very good to you yeah, so far. they have been. 38. You pick up a long knife that was lying on the ground and tuck it into your belt. With your sword in hand, you enter the cabin ready for any unexpected surprises. The cabin is yeah, very... a long knife, I oh, guess. Yeah. Yes. Man, this is like a very loot-heavy... Yeah, this game, this one's been like, you've, but it seems like a bunch of stuff that doesn't matter. It's like, you find a jar of worms, and a long knife, and seven teeth. <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah. Like, and, then, and like, all the stuff to like, if you want to sell all these things, was like way at the beginning of the book, which yeah. is weird. It's like, yeah. they don't let me double back. It's not like an RPG. You know what I mean? Like, oh, bags are full, gotta get back to the town. Who knows? We'll see. Um, okay. With your sword in hand, you enter the cabin ready for any unexpected surprises. The cabin is very basic. There are three rickety wooden beds lined up against one wall, and a table with three chairs set against the opposite wall. At the far end of the cabin, there is an iron cauldron bubbling away on top of a log fire burning in the hearth. Hearth? Hearth? It's hearth, right? Yeah, Not hearth. 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 The blue liquid is obviously the dye the old man was talking about. There are some cooking utensils and small jar jars of dried herbs, spices, and liquids on a shelf, but little else of interest. If you want to look at the labels in the jars, turn to 330. If you'd rather leave, uh, let's keep looking around. 3.30 is... The glass jars are labeled dried delia petals, zanhoke seeds, noop powder, red, horn, red thorn leaf, sif saf paste, lotus flower, and fire root juice. You can fit three jars in your backpack. If you wish to take any, take a note of which three you take. Finding nothing else of interest, you leave the cabin to carry on to Moonstone Hills. All right, so... Pack one, pick one. Sif Saf pays. I don't think it's remotely close. Sif Saf. Are you are you choosing these based on how fun they are to say? Yes. Noop powder. Noop. That's for when something happens. You're like noop noop noop. noop, noop, noop. <laughs> yeah, like noop. <laughs> and lotus flower. Okay. Cool. Chat wanted you to take the the fire root. Juice. Oh, stickle wax. Yeah, I didn't notice stickle wax. Stickle. I have so much stuff, dude. And there isn't like the I mean, how the system works in the books is there yeah. isn't like a thing for using stuff unless it actually like says if you have the whatever use it now. Oh, the juice? Mm, maybe you're right. The tomb juice. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not. Fire root juice? Yeah, I'm gonna not take the lotus flower. I'm gonna take the fire root juice. You're right. All right. We gotta take the juice. Fire root. Give him the juice. Yeah. Get the tomb juice. You know where they found that? Remember they found that tomb? You know what I'm is talking this, about? Is this re recently? Is this yeah. real? Yeah, they found oh, the okay. tomb, and there's the juice, the mummy juice. They found the red liquid. Gross. This is the tomb juice. Drink the juice. Did, did they drink it? I don't know. I'm assuming not. I don't think so. It probably would have died. <laughs> but I want them to drink. It was a moist mummy. Yeah. Everyone wants to drink the juice. That's how you get smarter. The tomb juice. 134. Okay. The rest of the afternoon passed. We. It said it was. It specifically stated it was getting dark. Remember when we first got to the, the first cabin? It was like, getting dark. Better find shelter. Do you want to keep I, going? I think it just said that you won't get to the hills before dark. Yeah, but now it's like late afternoon. 
Well, yeah, and it's you know, in, as you reach the base of the hills, the light begins to fade. So, oh, okay. I, Rest of the afternoon passes without incident. And as, a, as a side note, I like there's okay, so there's a bunch of goblins. Yes. And the guy was like, "Oh, thank you for saving me." They kidnapped me and put me up in this blueberry patch to keep the, uh, to to keep the birds away. Yeah. Or else they would eat me because they're carnivorous. Yes. And you're like, oh, so they don't eat the blueberries? Like, no, no, no. they use the blueberries to make dye to make their skin blue. Yes. And like, that's the end of the <laughs> that's conversation. It, it's it's full like, stop. <laughs> there isn't like. But why? Wait, wait, why? So why are these goblins making their like? Why are the goblins making the skin? It seems like the goblins are spending a lot of effort. Yeah. They're growing blueberries that they don't really want. They have to kidnap somebody they're to protect them. They're kidnapping a guy to protect them. Yeah. And Which they don't brewing, feed. And they're brewing all this, uh, they're brewing all this dye. Yeah. Just so they can dye their entire bodies blue. Yes. Uh, but think, we don't know why. Yep. Yeah. Look, Paul, sometimes you just need to take things at face value and not ask any questions. This might be one of those situations. All right. <laughs> uh, what were we doing? One thirty-four. Yeah. Uh, you reach the base of the Moonstone Hills as the light begins to fade. You look around, very much aware that you need to find somewhere safe to spend the night. There is not a lot of choice. You can either sleep where you are in the long grass, or build a bivouac. <laughs> build a bivouac out of fallen branches. Ah, huh. well, they did say if I was going to camp somewhere and I wanted to make a fire, right? Yeah. The, the old man specifically stated, bivouac. I'm, I'm building a bivouac, man. You kidding me? Bivouac. 250? I feel like I always, when I was a kid, I read that as like biovac. <laughs> a bivouac. Like, what's, what's a biovac? Biovac. Bivouac. I only knew bivouac was not to get too MTG related because there's a land in Frontier, Frontier bivouac. bivouac. Yeah, yeah is the only reason I know how to say bivouac. It doesn't take long to gather enough branches to build a bivouac. You start by making a tripod using the... Jeez, they're going to explain the whole process? <laughs> like, you start, but it's like, Ian can't you just say I build a bivouac? Ian Livingston did some research <laughs> on this, okay? He wants to tell you, he wants to show that he knows what he's talking about. Yeah, you start by making a tripod using the three longest branches, which you tie together at one end with a long strip of thin bark. You lean the remaining branches against the tripod until the, a tripod until the bivouac is complete, leaving a small opening on, at the bottom to climb through. Happy with your shelter, you rummage through your backpack and find a few scraps of food to eat. Add one stamina point. It's a cool evening, but you should be warm enough under your blanket inside the bivouac. If you want to build a campfire, nevertheless, turn to 144. If you'd rather go straight to sleep, turn to 107. They specifically stated, I wanted to light a fire, which is what I'm going to do. 144. To be fair, that guy was, like, tied up to a thing as a scarecrow. It's possible that he doesn't have the best judgment. Yeah. But I can't just, like, go through my whole adventuring life not trusting anyone. Mm. Right? You use the spare branches to make a fine crackling fire before crawling inside your bivouac. You roll out your blanket and lie down to at last to rest, enjoying the warmth of the flickering flames. A full moon rises into the night sky, and you stare at the bright stars, thinking about the events of the day before drifting off to sleep. You have vivid dreams and are woken up by a couple of times by creature noises, but the night passes without incident. You wake up early in the morning, gather up your belongings, and begin your climb to Moonstone Hills, determined to reach Skullcrag by noon. I was kind of hoping it was like, attracted by the fire, the werewolf <laughs> yeah. comes in. <laughs> that would be so good. Yeah, the animal's attracted. Uh, uh, Clearly marking yourself as easy prey. Uh, or the... The werewolf that was previously an old man. How do you stare into the stars if you're in a bivouac? No more questions. <laughs> like, like your bivouac has a lot of holes in the roof, okay? 368. Your magic doesn't work, you fall and die. Your bivouac doesn't work. You're eaten. The grass-covered foothills are easy enough to climb, but the going gets harder when the incline becomes steeper. Well, no shit. And you have to avoid loose rocks and stones. Each hilltop you reach, you look eastwards, hoping to catch sight of Skull Crag. Finally, you see what you are looking for in the distance. It's a hill which stands above all others, and more importantly, it has a rounded top which resembles a human skull. Oh, uh, hey, that hill that looks like a skull? <laughs> I bet just, that's Skull Crag. It's just Dr. <laughs> Wiley's castle. Yeah, uh, hey. <laughs> 
isn't that like where Captain Hook hung out and? Yeah, or like, uh, isn't it in Donkey Kong? Isn't there like, doesn't one of the mountains, one of the places in Donkey, like Donkey Kong Country, have like a Skull Island thing? It, or am I thinking of something else? Turns out there's like a weirdly large number of mountains that are shaped as skulls. Yeah, <laughs> it's like a very common shape for mountains to come in, apparently. Finally, you see uh, in the hill, blah, 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 human skull. Spurred on by the sighting, you scramble down the hill and press on. It's not long before you arrive at the entrance to a small cave at the foot of the next hill, which is still quite some distance away from Skull Crag. If you want to look inside the cave, turn to 265. If you'd rather keep heading east, turn to 236. I'm going to look inside. 265. I mean, we're literally unbeatable in combat. You step warily into the gloomy cave and notice small footprints on the sandy floor. Without warning, a soul-chilling howl breaks the silence. From out of the shadows at the back of the cave steps a shriveled, hunched-over old hag with long, thick gray hair and ragged clothes. The skin on her face is dry and wrinkled, and her eyes are sunken in their sockets and jet black in color. Her thin, loose-skinned arms and scrawny hands with blackened nails are stretched out in front of her. When she opens her mouth to scream again, you see she has no teeth at all. I have teeth. Not both my character and I have teeth in my pocket, too. You're like, hey, hey, witch, you want some <laughs> teeth? The wretched creature is a plague witch, and you must fight her. Oh. Um, there's a picture if you want to show anybody. Ah. All right, so there's some, there's a note here. If you lose any attack rounds during combat, the plague witch will have touched your skin and infected you with worm plague, which will quickly, quickly turn your eyes black and make you go blind just like her. It will be impossible for you to continue your quest. Your adventure is over if you win without losing any attack rounds. If you lose once, that's it. You just die. <laughs> Good thing you're like amazing at fighting, but holy crap. <sighs> Skill of five? Can I even lose this? Uh, what is? What can I lose to you? She has to get what? 15? No. Yeah, so the minimum she, I can roll is a 15. The minimum you can roll is a 15. So she needs at least an 11. She needs at least... 11 um, or 12, and then that's like... 11, she needs I can't 11 lose to her. Yeah. I can't possibly lose to her. I mean, oh, I can. You can I have possibly. to roll minimum, and she has to roll maximum. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Wow. I mean, this is why, like, if you had 7 attack now, it would be just like, oh, I guess this game is over. Just kind of <sighs> crappy. I don't want to lose to this, dude. This sucks. Okay. All right. Well, which goes first? That's a 15. I can tie it. Yeah. You, so, the okay. worst you can do is tying it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So five goes down to three. Which goes first? Okay. Goes down to one. Which goes first? One and a... Okay. Sick. If I lost that fight, that would be the unluckiest. Like, roll, it rolls maximum, I roll minimum. Like, what did somebody say? One in 1,296 chances. <laughs> That's but it's, pretty wild. And it's like there was no... I mean, I guess various people were like, oh, watch out for caves. But this wasn't even... That's like, wild. There wasn't even... Like, there was nothing that was like, oh, it's a super bad cave. Are you sure you want to go into it? Yeah. Yeah. Who's on the mic off screen? That's Paul. All right, well, we win, so we don't die randomly to this witch. Maybe we should be careful about picking fights if this is going to happen. I think this is the first... Oh, no, that's not true. We got bit... There was a poison thing before, right? You know. That was the spider. When we fought the spider in Citadel of Chaos, right. we got hit by it and we just died. Yeah, the instant death thing yeah. is a thing, yeah. Yeah, the spider. 375. Game design. A search of the cave yields nothing more than an old clay pot with a cracked lid. If you want to look inside the pot, turn to 51. If you'd rather leave the cave and press on towards Skull Crag, turn to 236. Well, I didn't come here to not look in the pot, so... 51. You find five gold pieces and a locket of gray hair in the clay pot, no doubt from the head of the blind hag. You must decide if you want to take the locket of hair as well as the gold pieces before leaving the cave to make your way to Skull Crag. I guess we'll take the hair. Got some teeth. I could just make a person. <laughs> I'm making... I can make an effigy. Okay. Uh, lock of mm. gray hair. and teeth, people. And I five gold. 
We have eight gold. Two thirty six. So oh, too far. Clambering up over, uh, clambering up and down hills, over boulders, rocks, stones, and shale all morning is very tiring and thirsty work. You slip over several times, hurting your arm in one particularly bad fall. Lose one stamina point. You push on, reaching a narrow gully between two steep hills, through or through which a stream is gently running. If you want to stop to fill your water flask, turn to ninety five. If you'd rather keep on walking east, turn to three forty five. There is literally no reason, game mechanics wise, for me to stop and fill my flask. I mean, I guess if in, as long unless somebody is like, "Hey, do you have some water for me later on?" I is have a water flask, though. Is it already? With well, I would assume so. Water in it? I mean, what if you had one stamina left? You fall and die. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like <laughs> they'd be like, "Ah, all this traveling is making you thirsty. Take a sip of water. If you didn't fill up your water flask, you die." I mean, maybe. There was an opportunity earlier on that you would have emptied your flask. For some I mean, reason. I'll I'll bite. I'll I'll take the bait. Okay, ninety five. We're gonna fill up our flask. You bend down to fill your flask. You suddenly hear the sound of rocks tumbling down from above. You spin around to see a huge boulder rolling down the side of the steep hill towards you, and dive sideways to try to avoid being crushed by it. Roll two dice. If the number rolled is less than or equal to your skill score. Return to, turn to 394. Oh, well, we can't lose. Yeah. You literally can't we lose. We literally can't lose. Yeah. Easy. I wonder if you, I want to see if you die. I just want to take a peek at 182. I just want to see. Does it actually kill you? Yeah. Yeah. You are unable to dive out of the way in time. The massive boulder hurtles down and crashes into you with fatal impact. Your adventure is over. <laughs> Holy crap, jeez. <laughs> oh my god. Yeah, Livingston isn't messing around, man. Yeah. Oh, that's so good. Oh, you're thirsty. You should get some water. Boulder. <laughs> yeah, idiot. I knew it, man. There's no reason for you to go fill up the water bottle. 394. All right. Well, we lived anyway, so it doesn't matter. But The massive boulder thunder past you and crashes into the stream, causing a huge splash of water. You scramble behind cover and look up to see two sinewy men with long, straggly hair and beards standing at the top of the hill, shaking their fists. They are wearing animal skins, and they are both carrying a leather bag and a quiver of arrows across their shoulders. The wild hill men reach for their bows and test and fire two arrows down at you. Test your luck. All right. Ten or... now ten, right? Yeah. I mean, 12 negates it, too. Like, 13 skill didn't change anything. Yeah, 12, 12 would... I had 12 skill anyway, so I'd make that check every time. It's equal yeah. to or less, yeah. So, luck... 10. Okay. Oof. <laughs> Oof. We go to 9, so we're at lucky. Uh, 55. Um... The arrows hit the boulder you were hiding behind, bouncing off harmlessly to land on the ground. The wild hillmen fire their remaining arrows at you, but they all miss. They shout down, shaking their fists angrily at you. One of them begins throwing rocks and anything at hand out of, or anything to hand out of frustration, including his shoulder bag and bow before walking off, cursing loudly. He throws his bow? This guy sucks! <laughs> hey, I'll find you. <laughs> He's like, oh no, I shouldn't have thrown everything. He's gonna get home and like his partner's gonna be like. What? So did you, did you get the guy? <laughs> yeah. uh, no. No, yeah. no. Where's your bow? I threw, right, it threw, it, threw it at him. Yeah. You're not. Th you're supposed to shoot the arrows at him. Don't throw the bow. I got mad. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, out of frustration for walking off, cursing loudly. When you feel the coast is clear, you come out from behind cover and open the leather shoulder bag to find one gold piece, a small box of fish hooks, and a small bag of salt. You take the items you want, and also the bow and six arrows fired at you, which are lying nearby. You fill your flask uh, from the stream and take a long drink of cool water. Add one stamina point. Your arm feels better. 
Okay, well, okay, so we got our stamina back. It's like, oh, good thing you're back. Uh, hey, uh, can you give me some of that salt? Uh, I uh, The stew is a little bit bland. Yeah, uh, so, okay, so we got a gold piece. So we have nine gold total. And then fish hooks? I feel like all these items they're giving us are dumb. Bag of salt. Like, they don't mean anything. There's no way we use... Look at all these, this laundry list yeah, of items yeah. I have. It's just like, you find every piece of garbage on your way. I'm like, ooh, treasure. <laughs> like, you never know when I'll need this. I like in... Um, there's a, one of the point-and-click adventure games that I played on stream, uh, Indiana Jones and the Fate of Atlantis. Yeah. There's a... One way you can go through the game is there's ton, there's bunches of stuff that you can pick up that doesn't do anything. That's just like random little like art not like artifacts but just like random little uh uh little tchotchkes and things that you pick up uh that have no purpose in the game except there's a section in the game where instead of fighting people you can just bri you can just like give them this stuff <laughs> as you go through <laughs> you're just like hey uh yeah. uh i'm trying to get through here oh yeah yeah if i give you this little like ceramic bird will you let me through yeah sure go ahead sure go ahead. that's what i'm waiting for it's like do you have any newt powder I'm like hmm yes I have noop powder to spare. Yeah. There you go. Uh, they've never given me a bow before. That's weird. I have a ranged weapon. Yeah, I wonder how that works. Yeah. Probably right. it doesn't. Probably it doesn't work. It probably kills me. The, bow, would, is, the bow string would... snaps, the arrow hits you in the eye, and you die. It's like, oh, sick. Yeah. It'll be like, if you would like to throw your bow at the enemy, <laughs> go to page five. It's the only way. That's probably the first time I've seen a bow. So the first time I yeah, see somebody use it, they're just like, ugh. Well, yeah, I guess that's how it works. Uh, 345. The gully opens out, uh, gully opens out onto a rock-strewn valley, at the end of which one hill stands out among, against all others. Its shape roughly resembles that of a giant human skull, almost as though somebody long ago had carved it that way. It is almost devoid of vegetation and has a rounded top. Two recesses high up resemble eye sockets, and a large rock sticking out below could pass for a nose. There is an entrance to a cave at ground level which could easily be mistaken for an open mouth. You hurry along the valley as quickly as possible, looking at your map, eager to explore inside Skull Crag. You arrive at the cave and peer inside to see nothing beyond, or see nothing but darkness beyond the su sunlit entrance. If you wish to enter the cave, turn to 79. If you'd rather climb Skull Crag to find another way in, turn to 281. So is this what they were talking about? Where there's an extra secret entrance 10 meters up? Or 20 meters up? I think, I, I, I mean, I think so. Did it say specific? I, I don't want to go back and think, and I don't want to look at Twitch chat because I'm trying to remember what they said. I'm pretty sure, I'm pretty sure that this seems like, like it's... They too... wouldn't have mentioned specifically climb up. Yeah, yeah. I'm climbing up, dude. 281. Let's hope all this random garbage I have can help me climb this... You begin your climb of Skull Crag, scrambling up the bare rock face with ease. You reach a ledge 20 meters up and notice a stack of sun bleached branches propped up against the rock face. You move the branches to one side to reveal a crack in the rock, which is less than a meter wide. The opening is just as described on Murgat Shur's map. You light your lantern and squeeze through the crack to find yourself in a narrow man-made tunnel, which has a low ceiling. The air is cool and still and has a slight musty smell. By the you way, you... Have a lantern. Yeah. Well, they, they said I had one right from the beginning, but... Oh, did they? Yeah. I don't okay. know why I wouldn't just, like, look inside the entrance. But, hey, it's neither here nor there. Considering, like, when you were fighting that, that whole, like, stuff down the cellar... Yeah. You kept, like, having to go down and then come back up because it was too <laughs> dark, and then go back down and then come back up. <laughs> I can't read this down here. It's Clink's lantern. <laughs> um, uh, where were we? Sorry. The air is cool and still, and it uh, has a slight musty smell. You walk along the tunnel for some 50 meters before coming to a junction. If you want to go left, turn to 301. If you want to go right, turn to 169. So it's left, right, right. Yeah. Because it's LR. That's easier to remember. Uh, left, 301. It just turn right, you're dead. I'm surprised that boulder kills you. You head down the narrow left-hand tunnel for 20 meters. The light from your lantern casting eerie shadows on the rough-hewn tunnel wall. You pass by a skeleton lying on the floor. One of its arms is pointed in the direction you are walking. The other is twisted up behind its back. Its upper torso is clad in chainmail armor. If you want to try on the chainmail armor, turn to 380. If you'd rather keep walking, turn to, three, turn to page 69. 
There was nothing in the in 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 the map about like don't put on the chainmail. Yeah. So what if we put on the chainmail? I mean, it didn't do this guy any good, but <laughs> I think it's cursed in page sixty nine as an omen. So if it was any page other than sixty nine, I would just skip it. I my gamer sense is firing at a highly accelerated rate. All right. So you're saying sixty nine? You're not you're gonna, not going to put on the armor? No. You reach a section of the tunnel where the floor is littered with rocks and rubble. One of the rocks appears to move, and you realize that it is not a rock, but a gray-colored creature. It is no creep bigger than a cannonball, and its plated exoskeleton looks to be almost as hard. You watch, the, you watch the creature uncurl and flip over onto four spindly crab-like legs. Its small head has large compound black eyes, long antennae, and mouth parts with three rows of sharp mandibles, which it uses to inject venom into its victims to paralyze them and feed off their blood. Two more gronks flip over and scuttle towards you. Fight them one at a time. If you win the battle without losing any attack rounds, turn to 208. If you win but lose one or more attack rounds, turn to 354. Ah, the gronk. So this is, yeah, so the thing saves you if you have a thing. Not yeah. that these guys will actually touch you, so. It's the same deal, right? Five, they have to roll 11 or 12 and I have to roll one. I have to roll minimum. Yeah. 11, 16. Yeah, okay. So, so it's probably a moot point. It's a mute point, Paul. Uh, first Gronk attacks. Fails. Gronk attacks. Fails. Gronk attacks. Ooh, an 11. That's a 16. I get kind of nervous when they roll max. I'm not going to lie. Uh, second Gronk. Fails. These guys are a little, the second one, third one are. Yeah. The extra, the one less combat round is like way bigger deal than like when the, when they're on like an odd number. Yeah. Yeah. It's a little bit scarier. Uh, so third one's dead. Yeah. Second one dies. Third Gronk. Fails and attacks again. Uh oh, it's, that's a 16. Oh, I saw the one I got. <laughs> Whoo, making me sweat. Jeez. Oh, jeez, Rick. At the, at the prospect of losing one combat ever. Yeah. Can you imagine that'll be like? Imagine if I had lost a combat to the witch. Like, it's like that's the only combat you ever lost. Yeah. Yeah. He got hit once and died. Uh, two oh eight. We didn't lose any combat, so. Flashing your sword swiftly through the air, you survive the battle unscathed. Add one luck. Yeah, see, look at that. Go to ten. Breathing a sigh of relief, you carry on down the tunnel and soon arrive to another junction. If you want to go left, turn to 197. If you want to go right, turn to 292. We go right. 292. It feels weird that they give instructions to the end of their dungeon <laughs> on the very beginning of the, like, immediately. <laughs> Like, yeah, the map just tells you where to go. Ahead you see the tunnel leads into a chamber which is lit by oil lamps. As you get nearer, you see there's a large iron cauldron suspended above a burning log fire by a chain attached to the ceiling, its simmering contents making dull bubbling and plopping sounds. A huge creature with a large round head lumbers into view with a long wooden spoon in its hand. Dark green in color, the creature has a bloated torso and stocky arms and legs. Its eyes and ears are small, but it has a wide mouth with bulbous purple lips and long teeth protruding from its lower jaw, many of which are broken. Yeah. It is wearing a filthy apron. <laughs> are you saying that because we have a bunch of teeth? Yeah, we're like, hey, <laughs> we'll trade you these teeth. Yeah. They're all nice and new. It is wearing a filthy apron which is stained with blood and grime. The Norgal stops, sniffs the air, and looks around before shuffling over to the cauldron. It dips the wooden spoon into the cauldron and scoops out a spoonful of thick green sludge with an eyeball sticking out. Oh, it puts the wooden the jar of eyeballs. It puts the wooden spoon to its fat lips and noisily slurps down the sludge before sucking the eyeball into its mouth with a large plop. Delicious, it says in a deep, rasping voice. Eyeballs are so succulent. Mmm. You watch the creature bite down on the eyeball, its jaw slamming shut. When the eyeball pops open inside its mouth, whereupon a wide smile of satisfaction spreads across its pockmarked face. 
You reach the tunnel beyond, you have no choice but to face the Norgal. If you have a jar of sheep's eyeballs that you want to offer the Norgal to let you pass, turn to 273. If you'd rather run in to attack the creature, turn to 17. If you said sheep's eyeballs, mm. reward yourself one point. Yeah, you got the worms. Yeah. Yeah, well. Well, we have to attack it, right? Yeah, we can't do anything. <clears throat> I don't like you saying that. That's a little tougher. The Norgol is a powerful creature which fights with brute strength and savage aggression. Dropping the jar of eyeballs onto the ground sends it into a rage, and it. L Wait. Wait. What? What? Dropping. But. I don't. We didn't. Okay. Dropping the jar of eyeballs onto the ground sends it into a rage, and it launches a frenzy attack on you with flailing fists. It is now eager to feast on your eyes. Its thick hide is not easy to pierce, even with your sharp-edged sword. Skill 10, stamina 9. All right. All right. This guy is actually An actual a fight. Yeah. So he's at minus. Basically, he, you have to roll two lower. Like, he has to roll two higher than you. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's probably the easier way of doing it. A four? I can't lose to that. No, 14. Yeah, 14 I can't lose to. So I win the first round. All right, three. He has to get... Norgal, seven, 17. Mm. Oh, I lost. I take two points of damage. The what? Norgal what? made me bleed my own blood. What is this feeling that you're feeling <laughs> ah, now? Okay, ah, it hurts. It's like, I don't like it. This is what I've been doing to people all this time. Yeah. <laughs> I'm a monster. Yeah. Uh, Norgal goes uh, 18. I go a lot. Norgal goes 14. I can't lose to that. Norgal goes 18. I go 19. And Norgal goes. I can't lose to that. Norgal dies. I got hit once. My beautiful face. If you win, turn 231. If you win. Ian Livingston. A search of the Norgal's lair reveals a string purse hidden in a small recess in the wall. You untie the purse and find it contains five gold pieces. Sick. We're up to 14. Add one luck point. Sick. We're back up to 11. You place the purse in your backpack and walk over to the tunnel at the back of the Norgal's lair and soon arrive at another junction. If you want to go left, turn to 46. If you want to go right, turn to 111. We go to right again, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. 111. I mean, I will put forward that you're following the stuff that it says on the map, and each time you do it, there's been a big monster there, which is a little bit disconcerting. Oh, yeah. Well... Whatever's the other way, it must be even worse. Yeah, I'm actually kind of curious. What is the other way? Uh, ahead, you see the tunnel opens up again and find yourself in an enormous underground limestone cave. Huge crystal slactites hang down from the high ceiling, which sparkles in the light from your lantern. Water drips down from the tips of long and short stalactites into pools on the cave floor, echoing loudly. You are excited to think you might be standing in the crystal cave shown on Murgat Shur's map. You notice that the ceiling to your right has a large round hole in it, as though something had bored its way through, and there is a patch of transparent goo on the floor directly beneath the hole. At the back of the cave, there is a large shard of crystal lying on the cave floor with an iron chest placed on it. If you want to walk over to look inside the chest, turn to 289. If you'd rather take a look, closer look at the hole in the ceiling, turn to 399. So there's something in the hole. But what's worse for me, if I look in the hole, or if I... Just go for the chest. So presumably, like the chest. So iron chest is like the whole point of what you're doing. Yeah. I'm going for the goo hole. Three ninety nine. You look up at the hole and suddenly feel something cold and wet land on your face. 
not water, but a jelly-like substance that begins to burn your skin. <laughs> Lose two stamina points. Wow. Oh, sick. You step away from under the hole as another glob globule drips down to the floor with a dull plop. You hurriedly pour water from your flask over your face to wash off the flesh-eating green slime as a gelatinous blob appears in the hole in the ceiling. Turn to 174. So what if I had not had water? This is where they're like, if you filled up your water at the creek, mm -hmm. that's where they should have got me. Yeah, it's a tricky one. Yeah. It's one of the limitations of the book. They can't, yeah. like, have a whole lot. So many different options. Yeah. 174. A huge, semi-transparent, gelatinous worm with pulsating innards, which produce a luminescent green glow, starts to slide down through the hole. It's a flesh-eating giant lava worm, a deadly creature and scourge of the cave trolls. The bloated jelly-like worm flops down onto the cave floor with a dull splat. It has a powerful sonar senses. Or it has powerful sonar senses for echolocation and slithers towards you, intent on dissolving you with its acidic, acidic mucus secretion and feeding on your liquid remains. Mm, you the must... giant, giant lava worm known for shooting acid. <laughs> oh my God! You must fight it. Normal edged weapons have little effect on lava worms. If you possess a pouch of salt, nice. turn to 21. If you do not have salt, you must fight the lava worm with your sword. Turn to 336. Oh, I'm sorry. If there's one thing Adam Savadan <laughs> has, it's salt. It's a pinch of salt. <laughs> <laughs> Joke's on you. I produce salt. Oh my god. Well, let's check my character sheet, sheet shall we? Bag of salt. Oh, would you look at that? Sometimes. 21. You rummage around inside your backpack to find the pouch and hurriedly pour the salt out into the palm of your hand. You hurl it at the giant lava worm bearing down on you and watch it thrash around trying to shake off the granules. But the salt sticks to its slimy skin and the worm's gelatinous flesh begins to melt like butter in a heated pan. Soon, there's nothing left on the floor apart from the innards and entrails lying in a pool of green slime. Turn to 382. A pinch of salt on a giant lava worm. <laughs> Pocket sand. <laughs> it's like, ah. <laughs> uh, well. A giant lava worm that shoots acid. How do I, why do I feel like we're almost at the end of this book already? A giant green lava worm that shoots acid. Why is it called a lava worm? Uh, well, it's more of a regional dialect. How big is this pouch of salt? Well, you pour it into your hand. It's like a like me i have big hands right it's probably just like oh i like that yeah the giant lava worm which was discovered by henry lava <laughs> it's just like a one of those confusing things uh, it's named after the person that found it yeah, yeah. yeah 382 hey everyone like comes in with all their like uh you know anti-fire magic be like ah i'm protected <laughs> from fire yeah acid <laughs> it's like oh, i got the salt Poking through the innards of the lava worm with the tip of your sword, you find a copper necklace with a circular copper name tag and the initials MG etched on it, lying in the pool of green slime. No doubt, the initials of some poor soul who came to the caves in search of gold but ended up as food for the lava worm. If you want to wear the necklace, turn to 57. If you'd rather leave it where it is and expect the iron chest, turn to 212. Okay. It's obviously so. not a necklace of lava worm protection no it doesn't, it doesn't. <laughs> well what's the name of that murgat sure is the name of the person that is it mg oh murgat sure it isn't mm. no murgat gur matt graining <laughs> yeah uh let's put it on yeah sure we skipped up on the armor i'm kind of curious the one thing i'm actually curious about is was that armor any good and i can't remember what page it was oh. but anyway we're going to 57 <laughs> oh, Whoops. Uh, the necklace is cursed and will bring bad luck and make you weak. Reduce your luck and skill scores by two points. Not yet aware of the effects of the cursed necklace, you walk over to the iron chest, turn to T12. How am I not aware? Well, it's cursed, so. Oh, no. My skill is 11. Your skill. Your... My luck goes to 9. Wow, your skill. You, you now are slightly less superhuman. Yeah. Oh, man. All right. 
212. It's a necklace of lava worm attracting. Although you're excited by the thought of having finally reached your goal, you approach the iron chest with caution. Much to your surprise, there's no lock on the chest. Sensing a trap, you lift the lid with the tip of your sword and cannot believe your eyes when you do. Apart from a small wooden box inside, the chest is empty. Somebody has beaten you to it. You curse loudly and kick the chest in anger, which sends it spinning across the cave floor. The wooden box falls out, and you pick it up to see that it is made of polished mahogany and has an ornately carved lid with a beetle motif in its center. You shake the box and hear something rattle inside. Inspecting it closely, you see that the lid is tight-fitting. If you want to open the box, turn to 307. If you'd rather put the box in your backpack without opening it, turn to 389. Opening is such a bad idea. So, well, there's, like, yeah, because the, the the guy, there, somebody said that there's a guy putting wooden boxes in places, <laughs> yeah. and they're, like, bad. I kind of want to open it, but I know it's so, we were so warned. Yeah. I'm going to. Maybe, maybe if you, like, keep it, then, like, later on, you can be yeah. like, hey, buddy, you want to open this box? Yeah, I'm going to. I'll give you this box. I'm not opening it. I'm curious to see if we don't ever end up opening it. 389. It's going to be like in the, the epilogue of the whole thing. You're like, ah, we we de we defeated the evil wizard and saved everybody. I wonder what this box is. <laughs> <Yes>. Open. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's just fucking ghosts come out and eat my face. Like, Ugh. You place the box in your backpack and walk over to the back of the cave, which you see is a dead end. You realize you have no option but to retrace your steps back to the outside world. You cross the cave floor and head back along the tunnel you came down. You soon arrive at a junction. If you want to go left, turn to 177. If you want to go straight on, turn to 316. Wait, what? So the tunnel we came down, turn left takes us just back to where we came from, right? Because we took a right to get here? Yeah, but why, why is it left and straight? I don't know. Because we came back the way we... Are we still in the cave? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we head back to the tunnel. Uh... Yeah, straight goes the way I haven't been. Yeah, let's go straight. 316. I mean, Austin 316 says... Wait, isn't that the way you said not to go? Uh-oh. You walk a short distance along the narrow tunnel when you suddenly hear a dull rumbling sound coming from behind you. Turn to 157. Uh-oh. You spin around, realizing the rumbling noise is the sound of rock grinding against rock. You turn back the way you came, peering into the gloom, arriving just in time to see a huge slab of rock Sliding down from the ceiling to land on the tunnel floor with a dull thud. You try pushing against the heavy stone slab, but it is a meter thick and impossible to lift or move. You give up trying and walk back to where you were a few minutes ago. You walk on another 35 meters and come to a dead end. You are trapped. There is no way out of the tunnel. You are caught in a trap by the cave trolls who will return in a week's time to take your, the possessions from your lifeless body. Your adventure is over. Welp. Uh, <sighs> what if we go back? Yeah, apparently the um, the the guy was pretty explicit about which directions to, to go. go. Yeah. Yeah, I guess if it's a T, then the way back is a. Mm, all right. Well, I don't want to start like a whole new game, right? Yeah, I, I think I I'm think gonna rewind. You, you can just rewind. Yeah, an instant death is. Do we remember what page we were on? Uh, yeah. Well, actually, I, I can run us back here. So, oh, 389? 389. So if we go 177? Okay, yeah. we'll go back to 177. Okay. Yeah. So we literally can't, like, veer off the path, because I think that's just death. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, like, if it was, like, an hour in, I'd probably restart and kind of, like, try to retrace my steps or something like that, but... Is it the, like, you know, Prince of Persia, where he's like, wait, no, that's not how this happened. <laughs> that's not how that happened, yeah. 
Uh, you soon arrive at the lair of the slain Norgal, where its cauldron is still bubbling away, suspended above the dying embers of the fire. You walk through the lair and soon arrive at another junction. If you want to go left, turn to 228. If you want to go straight on, turn to 316. Okay, so 316 is just the death. Yeah. So the, is that actually the same? Yeah, it's the same. 316 is the same. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So <laughs> we'll go. Yeah, the, the like left or straight versus right and left kind of screwed me up. But then I realized that like a T-junction would be, that's how it would work. Yeah. Actually. Okay, so 28, we're going back. Passing the lifeless Gronks and the Skeleton, you arrive at another junction. If you want to go right, turn to 347. If you want to go straight on, turn to 316. Yeah, we just go to 347. I mean, once you figure out that 316 is the bad number, you just don't go there. Yeah. It's not long before you see a speck of daylight at the end of the tunnel. You arrive back at the narrow entrance to Skullcrag and see the shape of a human figure silhouetted against the daylight. With your sword in hand, you call out to challenge the person standing in your way. You hear a young woman's voice calmly say, Put your sword away. I'm not looking for a fight. I picked up your footprints in the valley and followed you here. I thought that whoever made the effort to explore Skull Crag must have a good reason to do so. I'm pleased you made it out alive. What brought you here? If you want to reply that you are an adventurer looking for treasure, turn to 132. If you would rather let your sword do the talking and step forward to attack the woman, turn to 363. There's a picture, isn't there? Nope. I don't have a picture. No, I thought there was, but... Uh... So... You gonna talk to her, or are you gonna fight her? I think it's a trap. I'm gonna fight her. I'm tired of getting cursed, dude. Alright. As you stride towards her, you do not see the tripwire that was put in place by the ninja tracker. <laughs> Uh, that was put in place by the ninja tracker standing at the entrance to the cave. Your left foot catches on the near invisible wire and you trip over, knocking yourself out as you land heavily on the rock floor. When you wake up, you find yourself tightly bound and gagged and all your possessions gone. There's little hope that you will ever be found alive unless by cave trolls, which is not much consolation. Your adventure is over. Holy crap. <laughs> This is a very, um, like, linear, like, if you, it's like, do two things. One of them kills you, the other one continues the story. Yeah. Well, we're rewinding, Twitch chat. Yeah. We're too far, we're too far into this adventure just to restart. All right, well, we're not, we're going to announce loudly that we're an idiot adventurer looking for They're treasure. Like, I am going to attack, I mean, <laughs> say hi. <laughs> oh, this is like the two-page one. Oh, no, it's not, it's just a big page. Okay. Reassured by the warm voice of the mystery woman, you reply that you would be willing to tell her your tale in exchange for something to eat. She agrees to your offer and tosses over a small chunk of bread, which you devour in seconds. Add one stamina point. You're always hungry. <laughs> yeah, dude. It's me. This character is me. I'm always hungry. I'm hungry right now. You walk towards her with your hand outstretched to shake her hand. Stop, she says sharply. There's a tripwire in front of you. Oh, she's actually nice. <laughs> it's like I was the asshole. I got punished for being a dickhead. Oh, fancy that, eh? Mm. Uh, there's a tripwire in front of you. I set a trap earlier. You just can't be too careful these days. You step over the tripwire and are greeted by a friendly looking young woman who is dressed in black robes, black cotton trousers, and black leather sandals laced up over her calves. She has piercing brown eyes and long dark hair tied back in a ponytail. A two-handed curved sword is slung across her back. My name is Hakasan Za. I am a ninja tracker from Zengus. And you? You tell her your name, Taku Jeff, and why you came to Skull Crag, and show her the treasure map drawn by Murgot Shur. You scoff, saying that whilst the map was accurate, the treasure, if there had been any in the first place, is long gone from the iron chest. The tracker smiles, saying, Oh... So it's one of Schur's maps, is it? Wait. Does everybody know? It's like everybody knows that Murgot Schur's maps are horseshit. I'm like, oh man. Uh, so. yeah. That charlatan makes copies of old treasure maps, which are usually years out of date, and gets his minions to sell them to fools and chalice in Port Black Sand. As you found out, they are not worth the paper they are written on. What are you going to do now? You reply that you have no plans other than to leave Skullcrag. I've got no plans either. 
Do you want to team up to go treasure hunting? What is this book? What? <laughs> We're just going to like start a different adventure now. Oh my God. <laughs> That's... If you want to say yes to Hakasan's proposal, turn to 81. If you'd rather politely refuse, turn to 340. She definitely stabs you if you refuse. Oh, I, I mean like... That's so weird. This is the first time we've ever had like a partner. Yeah. If and they like go through with it. All right, I guess we're going to team up. 81. Don't kill me. Remember, there's a, uh, the video game Journeyman Project. Yeah. Uh, there's a part, or Journeyman Project 2, there's a part where you have, there's like this AI, Arthur the AI, who's awesome, who's like your buddy throughout the entire thing, but... He doesn't join you until partway through the game, or like a little bit into the game. <laughs> and at one point, he's like, hey, can I join you? And then a thing pops up on the screen, and it says, yes, in like huge calligraphic <laughs> font. And then there's a little teeny weeny no at the <laughs> <laughs> below. <laughs> I like somebody, somebody said that it's, it's a... It's a box with a, like a mail-in address to get the new to buy the new book. Like, oh, uh, yeah, if you yeah. want to continue this adventure, like, <laughs> want to continue this adventure, send this money. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Excellent. Let's go. Hakasan says enthusiastically. Yeah, she's definitely DLC. You exit the cave together, stepping outside onto the ledge where the bright sunlight sunlight hurts your eyes, making you squint. You scrabble down the crag to the main entrance to the cave. Peering inside, you see nothing but dark shadows beyond the sunlit entrance. I wouldn't go in there if I were you, the ninja tracker warns. Let's head west to the eastern plain. You walk back down the valley, exchanging stories about your adventures, when suddenly two tall, ugly creatures with tusked mouths and long hair braided with bones jump out from behind a large rock. <laughs> <laughs> they are wearing animal furs and advance towards you, swinging their spike clubs above their heads. They are hill trolls, and you must fight them. You opt to take on the taller of the two. Uh, me, the alpha male. Uh, skill of 9, stamina 9. I have a skill now of 11, so there is a chance that I could take some damage here. Stamina 9, eh? Because I'm a gentleman. She takes on one of the things. Yeah, there were two, and so she's fighting one. <laughs> I'll take the tall one, you take the strong one. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay, uh, Hill Troll goes first. It's a 15. I go... That's a 16. It was actually like a thing where you're like, oh, I'll, 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 I'll take that one. You take 18. the other one. And then the one you said, like, stood up and turned out to be way taller than you were expecting. <laughs> you're like, oh, like, crap. <laughs> <laughs> Hill Troll got an 18. I got a 17. I take two, <gasps> two points of damage. I am at 17. Uh, Hill Troll's 15. Adam. Take two points of damage. Oof. Kill troll, 17, Adam, a lot. Hill troll is at 5 hit points. Hill troll goes 12? Can I even lose to that? No. Hill troll goes to 3 hit points. Hill troll gets a 17. I get an 18. Hill troll goes to 1. Hill Troll, 17, Adam, a lot. Hill Troll dies. 102. Okay. You look around to see Hakusan wiping Troll's blood off the razor-sharp blade of her magnificent sword. They never learn, stupid creatures, she, she says dismissively. A search of the troll's pouches yields three gold pieces and two silver buttons. Hmm. So, 17. Okay. Well, it's a start, she says cheerfully. You set off again, talking about past adventures, with Hakasan asking lots of questions. You never did tell me what you found in Skull Crag, only that the treasure was missing from that iron chest. You reply saying you found a wooden box in the iron chest, which you take out of your backpack to show her. She takes it from you, and on seeing the carved beetle motif on the lid says, This looks like one of G Gernard Jaggle's deadly puzzle boxes. Haha! -ha, nice! Oh, it's a good thing I didn't open it. You have to be been very... de definitely an instant death. <laughs> you have to be very careful when opening these. 
She turns it over and over, examining it carefully. She presses down the, on the lid and, at the same time, pushes her thumb against one side of the box. A small section of wood slides out. She repeats the action on the other sides of the box until there are four sections of wood sticking out. With a look of intense concentration on her face, she carefully lifts the lid, breathing a sigh of relief when it's open and says, Phew! Now what have we got here? We just had to find a ninja. I... Uh, she goes, oh, you have to be very careful about these. Pushes the latch on the side and dies. <laughs> <laughs> that would be so sick. Oh my god. Yeah, she just fucked. And then you're just stuck with like a triggered... And then you can just open it like because it's been yeah, triggered yeah. already. Yeah. Like, well, I guess that's one way to open uh, the There are three items in the puzzle box. A small glass vial with green gas swirling around inside. A small lead ball and a folded piece of paper. Gurnard didn't disappoint us. The green gas is most likely poisonous. What are you going to do with the vial, she asks, inspecting it closely before handing it to you. If you want to put the vial in your backpack, turn to 321. If you want to throw it as far away as possible, turn to 150. I feel like putting it in my backpack is going to kill me. It's like at some point later on until like you roll and... <laughs> yeah. You, like you trip it. and it just cracks and you just like... So we're going to say, yeah, yeah, yeet. We're going to... Okay, 150. <laughs> no! Shrieks Hakasan as the glass vial flies through the air. <laughs> what are you gonna do with this? You just grab it, don't say anything. You're just like, fuck this vial, <laughs> this vial of poison. <laughs> oh my god. Uh, test your luck. Uh, I gotta roll under a nine or under. Didn't you get extra luck somehow? No, I lost oh, no. two. Oh right, yeah, yeah. I rolled a seven anyway, so I'm lucky. 248. <laughs> the vial lands intact on a patch of grass some 20 meters away. Hakusan looks at you in a state of shock and says, We are very lucky the vial didn't break. It could have been the end of us. But let's not worry about that now. Turn to 321. The illusion of choice! She's like, okay, I'm not going to give you things anymore. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> oh my, throw them away. My, luck, my luck drops to eight. I should probably just drink that vial of luck now. Because it doesn't give me, it give, puts me back up to 12. Because yeah. I have 11. Yeah, could you? Yeah, I'm going to drink the vial of luck now and just go up to 12 luck. Just to play it safe. Um, you accidentally chugged the vial of poison. <laughs> yes. <laughs> 321. Okay. Hakasan takes the other two items out of the box and says, I have no idea what the lead ball is for, but you might as well keep it. I'm Throw it! <laughs> That'd be so good if I just took it. <laughs> no! Stop throwing it! <laughs> <sighs> I have no idea what the lead ball is for, but you might as well keep it. I'm more interested in what's written on the paper. You take the paper from her and read out the message on, wi on it, which says, Congratulations, you survived my puzzle box trap. You must be disappointed that the golden amulets were missing from the iron chest. So was I. But I did find a very special treasure. GJ. Hakusan looks at you dis in disbelief and says, It looks like Murgat Shur's map was genuine after all. Gernard Jagel must have had a copy of it too. People said he was dead. Is he really still alive? I wonder what he found that made him so happy. I mean, you, it was a legit map. It was just an old map. Yeah. You tell Hakasan that when you were in Chalice, you heard the original owner of the map say that he'd been told there was a gold ring in the chest that was worth more than all the golden amulets put together. It was called the Ring of Burning Snakes and used to belong to a wizard called Nico, who would pay a lot to get it back. Nico? I've never heard of a wizard called Nico. He must have met Nicodemus, the grand wizard who lives as a recluse under the singing bridge in Port Blacksand. If the ring was his, why would he be so desperate to get it back? I heard he had given away all of his worldly possessions, Hakasan says, frowning. Anyway, I'm going to look for tracks just in case Gernard Jagel was here recently. If you want to help Hakasan look for tracks, turn to 304. If you want to look for something to, the e to eat first, turn to 117. <laughs> Oh, well, I'm a simple creature, Twitch chat. You eat the lead ball. You're dead. <laughs> Exposition the ninja, yeah. 
We have you find 10 days of rations in your backpack. Dude, I want to see what happens when we try to eat. We've kind of cheated already. I don't know if that goes against the spirit of the book, but like restarting at this point is just With like the insta death thing is just like at a certain point it's just like memorizing yeah. the things. As some some mentioned in the chat that we're kind of into the, the it's like Dragon's Lair. Remember that that yeah. like thing where it's just like Dude, that game's hard as heck. Yeah, it's just like push the right button combination or just die. Yeah. All right, uh, 117, you see an old tree trunk with crumbling rotten bark, which is host to a clustering of fiery red cap mushrooms. Your stomach rumbles noisily, and you realize just how hungry you are after your exploits in Skull Crack. Hakusan sees you looking at the mushrooms and shouts at you not to eat them, as they might be poisonous if you want to eat the mushrooms. <laughs> Oh my god. I feel like she she's continually reevaluating her expectations of this like relationship. This game just got <laughs> this book just like went off the rails completely. Like, oh man, she's this like, is awesome. She's like, oh, okay. Okay. Okay, I'm not gonna You're eat You're an them. idiot. <laughs> <laughs> you just see me like, I'm not gonna eat it, I'm not gonna eat it, I'm not gonna eat it. She's like, okay. And then like she like turns around and die for them. I'm gonna try. Yeah, I gotta she, eat them. She wants to keep the mushrooms for herself. <laughs> 285. You're gonna eat them? Yeah. The mushrooms taste a little bitter, but do at least fill you up. You set off again, but it is not long before you start to feel unwell. Your stomach is gripped by a sharp pain and you break out in a cold sweat. Moments later, you are violently ill. You drop to your knees, clutching your stomach, writhing about on the ground in agony. The redhead mushrooms you have eaten are deadly. And you have no suitable antidote. Your adventure is over. So. We didn't actually eat the mushrooms. <laughs> yeah, 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 I'm not going to eat them. I just want to see what would happen. <laughs> look. Aren't... Would you... Look, Twitch chat. We didn't eat them. 304... We're going to see this to the end. I feel like, I feel like, a, I had a feeling that these streams would not devolve into this, but this would come up. Like, we would this just is, this kind is of read through way, it. This is way more. There's way more deaths in this, this is one. way more The brutal. book, the first one was actually the tamest. Yeah, yeah. The first one just had like, oh, you, it had you know. had the maze in it. Yeah. You couldn't actually die in that, really. <laughs> Why didn't I eat the delicious mushrooms? I'm not that hungry. Okay, three or four. You zigzag across the valley heading west, but do not pick up any tracks that were not your own or Hakkasan's. Gernard was either here a long time ago or he covered up his tracks pretty well. I can't find any sign of him being here. Hakkasan shouts over to you. <laughs> uh, you continue scouring the valley floor for footprints and spot something under a bush which turns out to be a bronze shield left by somebody who must have hidden it there for some reason. If you want to take the shield, Turn to 257. If you'd rather leave it and where it is and what, because <sighs> they can't possibly all be cursed, right? That would be ridiculous. I'm taking the shield. You place your arm through the leather straps on the back of the shield and rattle your sword against the broad's face. It makes a loud clatter, which echoes down the valley. Hakasan salutes you, calling out to congratulate you on finding a dwarf warrior shield. Add one skill point. Delighted with your new piece of armor, you walk on. All right, we're back up to 12. I feel like you should just be like, uh, Hakasan, there's a thing here. Can I touch <laughs> yeah. it? <laughs> yeah, it's like... Is it going to give me an owie? Yeah. Throwing vials. Don't throw that. Don't eat that. She's just telling me a lot of stuff I can't do. All day, tell me what I can't do, right? Yeah, yeah. 359. I'm not even keeping a map at this point. I'm just... You reach the end of the valley where you decide to give up on your search for Gurnard Jaggle's tracks to focus on treasure hunting. <laughs> this is boring. Let's hunt treasure. <laughs> I thought that's like the point was yeah. to find his tracks. So now we've hunt. given up, Paul. All right. We're we're true. We're millennials. We're just like I, if we didn't get instant gratification, we're like, oh well, this is too much work. You're I I feel like you're you're uh, if you have seen Parks and Recreation, like Chris Pratt's character in Parks and Recreation. Yeah, you're just like whatever you feel like doing at any given time. You're just yeah, like, yeah, I'm just gonna do that now. Yeah, we're gonna do that now. 
You head down the gully, mindful of an ambush, but pass through it without incident. By the time you finally reach the western edge of Moonstone Hills, the sun is low on the horizon. As the shadows lengthen, you hurry northwest across the eastern plain towards the tumble-down ruin of an old farmhouse, which looks like a good place to camp for the night. In the far distance, you see the great wall of trees which marks the edge of Darkwood Forest. If you want to stay in the ruined farmhouse for the night, turn 228. If you want to press on Darkwood Forest, turn to 136. Uh, we're going to stay... The farmhouses have, have been lucrative. Served, you, served you well. Yeah, they've been lucrative. 228. There is no sign of life. The main farmhouse building is a total is in total ruin, but there is a wooden pig pen at the back which remains standing. You open the hatch, and your nostrils are met by a ripe, fruity aroma, which makes you cough. But at least the pig pen is dry inside, has a roof and four walls, and should keep you uh, keep out unwanted creatures of the night. Hakusan says she is willing to, or she is going to try to catch a rabbit for supper in the dying light of the day. You wish her luck and build a fire using the wood from a broken table you find in the ruins. With the fire lit, you rummage around the ruins and find a pair of dirty old leather boots inside a wooden box inside a wooden box hidden under some rubble. They appear to be your size. If you want to try on the boots. They can't all be cursed, right? We just found a sweet shield. We have rations at home. Yeah, it's like we never eat, dude. It's like I have ten days of food and can't use it. Never know. They're my size. It's a sign. 393. The boots were taken by a dwarf many years ago from the body of a high elf who died at the hands of a shape changer in Darkwood. <laughs> wow, this has got a, quite a journey. <laughs> Why is it <this> so specific? <laughs> mm, yes, yes, these 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 look like elf boots, but but no, there's something something. I feel like they've been handled by a dwarf, a dwarf. after. After they were attacked by a goblin, no, not a what goblin. What do you mean never punished? I put on an amulet and lost two points of skill. Okay, the dwarf used them as payment for food and lodging at the farmhouse where they were put in a box and forgotten about. Despite their worn out appearance, the boots are incredibly comfortable and have magic properties. You have found a pair of elven boots, add one skill and one luck. So we're, are we saying that we're going up mag, beyond mag? I don't think my luck, I don't, I'm going to say my luck can't go above 12. Yeah, that makes sense. But I mean, pulling... your luck is already higher than it was started. At, yeah. Right? We got our we got our skill back though. Turn to ninety eight. Imagine if we hadn't got the cursed amulet and it had fourteen skill. Silly. Racking up. Like, anybody want to fight? The light quickly fades as the sun sinks below the horizon, but the moon shines brightly in the clear night sky, casting an eerie twilight across the landscape. Suddenly, you hear a familiar voice calling out to you. Good to see you've got a fire burning. Test your luck. If you're lucky, okay, well, we have 12 luck. Can't fail this. So go down to 11 luck. 324. Hakusan comes bounding into view with a beautiful smile on her face. Not one rabbit, but two, she announces with smug satisfaction, dropping the dead rabbits on the ground in front of you. It's not long before you are feasting on spit roast rabbit to the point where you feel you are going to burst. Add three stamina points. If you weren't lucky, would it have been somebody else who called out to you? <laughs> yes. She trips and falls in the rabbit. Your rabbit falls in the dirt. Uh, you stoke the fire before retiring to the pig pen, taking it in turns to sleep whilst the other keeps watch. You hear sporadic grunts and growls outside, but the night passes without incident. Set off early next morning towards Darkwood Forest, convinced that your treasure hunting fortunes will soon change. Turn to 56. I like how I've completely given up on, like, I guess I had to give up on my quest because... Well, you, you finished your... Yeah, I finished my quest. quest but like, I guess now the you're just, like, bumming like, around with her. Yeah. Like, I got nothing better to do. All right. Check out a bit. I like she she goes out to to get rat like I'm gonna go hunt some rabbits. You, she comes back. You're like, hey, check out my boots. <laughs> yeah, they're magic. <laughs> yeah. It's like where'd you find those? In, In a box. box. Yeah. It's like what did I tell you about opening <laughs> random things while I'm not here? <laughs> you reach an area of tall grass that is waist height in parts and draw your sword in case some unseen enemy might pounce on you. Something momentarily blocks out the sun overhead and you look up to see a gigantic predatory bird flying west. With its huge wingspan, curved black beak, 
and fire red feathers, there's no mistaking the Warhawk. A large wicker basket is gripped in its talons and appears to contain a huge block of stone. We have a bow and arrow. Mm -hmm. Suddenly, the Warhawk lets go of the basket with one foot and it swings down, forcing the giant bird to bank sharply on the right, losing height. It is unable to recover and lets go of the basket completely. It soars back up into the sky and flies off, squawking loudly. The basket plummets to the ground and you hear loud screams coming from inside the basket, which lands in the tall grass with a dull thud disappearing from view. The screams are replaced by groans coming from where the basket landed. If you want to investigate, turn 17. If you'd rather keep walking. You're like, yeah, this is interesting. <laughs> a giant bird just flew by holding a basket and then dropped that basket and there's shouts coming from inside the basket. Yeah. yeah. I'm going to keep walking. This is... A, this is... Seriously? Yeah. <laughs> What are you new here? I'm out of here, man. Peace out. I like the way it, it's the way that you're like alternately like, oh yeah, I'm totally gonna do this. It'd be stupid not to. Yeah. Yeah. All right. <laughs> DM grumbles. You walk on and suddenly feel something warm and wet land on your head with a splat. You look up to see the warbird circling overhead and understand the grim reality of what has landed on you. Lose one luck point. The bird shit on me? Oh. Okay. Go down to 10 luck, dude. <laughs> this fucking game sucks. <laughs> I like the way Hawken is just like, you know what? I'm going to let you make all the decisions yeah. and just follow you and just be like, yeah, yeah, that's a dumb idea. The soggy poop starts to trickle down the side of your head and has a very unpleasant smell. You wash it off with water from your flask, but the smell lingers. That will teach you not to ignore a cry for help, Hakusan says, trying not to laugh. You curse your luck and decide to head back in the direction for where the bath, the illusion of choice. Ah. Uh. You know what? I deserve that. Okay. DM was like, yeah, the bird shits on you. You stride through the tall grass as fast as you can or you can in the direction of the groaning man. Test your luck. If you're lucky, turn to 24. If you're unlucky, turn to 217. So, 10 or under. 9. Okay. Mm -hmm. We lost a lot of luck all of a sudden. We're back down to 9. Uh, 24. You're not far from the wicker basket when you hear a familiar loud squawk overhead. You look up to see the warhawk swooping down to attack. You must fight the giant predatory bird which has returned to pick up the basket. With Hakusan fighting by your side, you were able to attack twice during each attack round. Ooh, neat. I guess oh. she's like just How do I possibly lose this? Skill eight. I have a 13 skill, I get to attack twice. I mean, it's possible for you it's to possible, lose. It's possible, yeah. I guess, okay. Warhawk, okay, Warhawk goes, uh, it's a 14. I have a 13 skill. I can't lose. It has to roll at least a 7. Yeah, right? it has to roll a 7 to be able to tie you. Yeah. I I like the way you were... It's like you were like, no, Warhawk, I'm going to leave you alone. I don't yeah, want to attack like, you. And the Warhawk pooped chilling. on your head. Uh, Warhawk. That's a 10. That's an 18. So... Uh-oh. It's a 15, or 16. Okay. I won the second Wait. fight. I rolled twice. Wait, if she, if what? you get, I guess you take, <laughs> she's like fighting and you're fighting, but you're taking all the damage. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah not yeah. very fair. But I mean, if I die, she dies, right? I'm assuming. Uh, uh, I feel like if you die, she just like, Her goes, goes rolls a 20. Cool. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I attack. I roll a 20. Well, I at least tie it, but I get to roll twice. Right? Okay. I tied it. Bird, uh, eight, 16, I roll a lot, it's two. I guess it's just, just roll twice and take the higher one. Yeah. Bird gets a 15, so I can tie it. Okay, bird dies. If you win, turn to 367. Holy shit. This is like a fucking, this is the three page fucking entry. Okay. My voice is starting to go. It is only when you reach the wicker basket that you realize just how big it is. It contains a huge... or something? <laughs> no, I'm good. It contains a huge rectangular block of black stone 
which has been carved on one side with the scene of an advancing army of skeleton warriors being urged on by a robed skeleton figure holding a scythe who has spikes jutting out from its skull and lizard-like eyes. Beneath the stone block lies a man with dark hair. The lower half of his body has been crushed. You cut the vines, keeping the lid of the basket shut to try to pull the man out, but you are unable to free him, even with both of you trying to lift the stone. He stares at you without blinking, his eyes wide open in fear, knowing there is nothing you can do to save him. He reaches out, clutches your arm, and in a stuttering voice says, He's coming back. He's coming back. You've got to stop him. You've got to stop him. The poor man screams out in pain as he tries to sit up and take a drink of water from your flask. Hakusan tries to comfort him whilst he breathes in and out sharply, noisily spraying out water through his gritted teeth. He calms down and starts talking rapidly, desperate to tell his tale. Listen carefully, stranger. I don't have long. My name is Horace Wolf. I am a stonemason. I live in a small hamlet north of Anvil. One day months ago, one day months ago, yeah, I returned home after delivering a gargoyle to a customer in Stonebridge to find two spirit stalkers waiting. The undead messengers of evil wore black hooded cloaks and were sitting motionless on huge steeds, black stallions with fiery red eyes, with my wife standing beside them in chains. In hissing voices, they warned that unless I did their bidding, I would never see Luana again. They took her away that day, and ever since I have been carving the, this block of granite. This morning, the spirit stalkers returned and summoned a warhawk to fly me to Yastromo's tower. My task was to put this keystone in place there, but as we flew southwest, I realized that Al Alantia would be doomed if I did. I stabbed the warhawk's foot with my chisel, hoping to make it land, but it let go of the basket and I crashed to the ground. I know my injuries are fatal, and I'll never see my wife again. But I did, I, but I had to do it to keep Alantia safe, what? at least until the spirit stalkers come calling for their keystone. Alantia is the name of the like the world. Yeah. Oh, okay. Or should I say, my tombstone? The man chuckles briefly at his own dark humor, <laughs> coughs, and falls silent. One of those terrible injuries that he only lasts long enough to give a chunk of exposition and then <laughs> tell me there. a story, a very specific story about delivering like, a gargoyle <laughs> with like, yeah, a lot of like weirdly specific, unnecessary details. Yeah. Uh, you mop his fevered brow and ask him why Alantia is in danger. Bone, Zanbar bone. His tower was once destroyed and he with it forever. It was thought, but I know differently. The second coming of Bone is nigh. <laughs> how, how do you sit there on your, you know, computer and write those words and not be like, oh, wait. <laughs> Holy shit. Oh, my God. Oh, man. Okay. Second coming of Bone. His loyal servant, Lord Azur of Port Black Sand, has been plotting his return, using arcane magic to turn Yastromo's tower black, and when this keystone is in place, the tower will itself summon Zanbar Bone to return from his twilight existence on the demon plane to rule Alantia. Hakazan asks for more information about the man called Zanbar Bone. In an angry voice, he replies, Man? Did I say Zanbar Bone is a man? Zanbar Bone is not a man, nor anything resembling a man. He is undead. He is the Night Prince. You must stop. <laughs> you must. <laughs> you must stop Bone. You must warn Yastromo. You must get help from Nicodemus. You must rescue my wife, Luana. You must. Uh... But before he can finish this sentence, the stonemason's, stonemason's mouth falls open. And his eyes widen into a fixed stare. His body stiffens as he sucks in his last gasp of air, exhaling slowly before slumping back down to the ground. The poor man, what a terrible curse to put upon him. And what of Lord Azur and Zanbar Bone? What does all of this mean? Are we doomed? Or was he just delirious after the fall? <laughs> he got yeah, probably in not half. important. Let's just go do something else. <laughs> he was crushed in half. He got smushed, you idiot. Why, are, why is everyone in this fucking universe a moron? <laughs> 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 
There's something about <sighs> being in a basket being carried by an enormous bird. Yeah. Uh, and then falling out of the bat, like, and then the bird drops the basket and the basket falls to the earth. And what kills you is being crushed by a <laughs> rock that was also in the basket. It was also the thing you had been working on. <laughs> the thing you had been chiseling. Yeah, mm. yeah. That's okay, so you're ready rock. for these options? If you want to reply that you believe Horace's story, turn to 238. If you want to reply that you believe he's delirious and speaking nonsense, turn to 190. I, oh man, I really want to see what happens when you just say, I disbelieve. I mean, at that point, it's like you decide he's speaking nonsense. Yeah. So you go home. Your adventure is over. Yeah. It's like not over because it's... I'm going to take a peek. One night. I just want to see it. It's got to be just you die or you lose or you whatever. Oh, shit. It's not. Huh? Okay. I guess we're just going to disbelieve him. Yeah. Okay. All right. Hakusan stares at you coldly and says, I'm not so sure. You just said he was delirious. We agreed with you! And she's like, wait a second. <laughs> You're not, no! How did he know so much about Zambar Bone? And how do you explain the keystone? But as you wish, let's get him buried and be on our way. Poor man, what a terrible way to end his life. You find a long branch to use as a lever to lift up the rock block of granite, enough to pull poor Horus out from underneath. You bury him and mark his grave with a pile of small bones, or a small pile of stones, that Hakazan notably silent throughout. With, sorry, lost in solemn thought. So, where should we go now? And she asks without much enthusiasm of her voice. If you want to say you should keep on walking towards Darkwood Forest, turn to 139. If you want to suggest that you head west, turn to 342. This is really, this is like what happens like when you're a DM and your characters keep ignoring all your plot threads. You're just like, <laughs> okay, so now what are we doing? We're just like wandering around? <sighs> I want to see what happens when you agree. Do we remember what page we were on? Do you? Yeah, I can. I can go back. 367? It's the wrong one. Okay. Uh, it's 238 to find out if you believe me. Oh. 238. Is this like... Wow, this is like two completely different directions. Hmm. Huh. I mean, like, what do we do? Like, I just like... This book's good. This has gone, like, completely off the rails, like, it wasn't the illusion of choice, it's, like, an actual choice. And now I'm interested about, like, both. Let's just keep, I'm gonna keep going to the, end, the, the decision that we picked originally, so 190. And then we'll go to 139, we'll keep going into the forest. That's wild to me. That's really good. <laughs> you are not far from the outer edge of Darkwood Forest when Hakusan makes a sudden announcement. I think I've lost my appetite for treasure hunting. I can't get Horace's worrying tale out of my head. That black keystone looked very ominous to me, and so I'm going to go back to Zengis to warn our townsfolk. I'm sorry, but I'm going to say goodbye. You try to convince her not to go, but she is having none of it. A quick hug, a smile, and a wave goodbye, and she's gone, striding northeast across the plain. You walk alone towards the mighty oak tree standing tall in front of you with your mind spinning, thinking about the events of the past 24 hours. You see a gap in the trees where an animal path cuts through the thick undergrowth and tangled roots. You enter the forest, which is a stark mixture of light and shadow. Shafts of bright light shine down through holes in the blanket of leaves above, from where a, cacoph a cacophony of sound comes from the twittering birds warning the forest inhabitants of your presence. So yeah, you're just like ignoring the plot and she's like, yeah, I'm going to go do that. And now you're sort of by yourself in the forest again. Yeah. Alright. It's not long before you reach a fork in the path. If you want to follow the right-hand path, turn to 385. If you prefer to take the left-hand path, go to 87. Let's go to 385. You see a well-worn, studded leather gauntlet nestling in the undergrowth to the left of the path. It is damp and covered with mildew. 
you want to try it on, turn it to 270. It's going to be like a naked dwarf somewhere at the end of this. <laughs> it's like, oh, you have all my stuff. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'm going to try it. 270. Oh, my God. A sharp pain shoots up your arm the moment you put your hand inside the gauntlet. You try to take it off, but you are unable to do so. You are wearing a cursed gauntlet of ruin. Lose two skill points and two luck points. You feel incredibly dizzy and barely able to walk. You stagger off the path, slump down in the undergrowth, and fall fast asleep. You wake up hours later with somebody tapping you on your shoulder. You sit up with a start and recognize the familiar face of Hakusan kneeling over you, grinning. Have a nice nap? Hakusan asks mischievously. Suddenly, her expression changes, and she says in a serious voice, We can't just ignore what happened back there. I wouldn't walk away without knowing the truth. Or I couldn't walk away, sorry. You have to come with me to find Yastromo. We have to warn him. We might be under attack even as we speak. You agree that her reasoning makes perfect sense and apologize for thinking otherwise earlier. She asks about the gauntlet and you explain what happened. What's that? Oh. Uh. <laughs> you weren't here. I got worried and I put this on. I just picture fucking our character with like a Chinese finger trap. Like he's... <laughs> what happened here? Nothing. <laughs> like... I want, I, I'm, just, I'm just keeping this like this because I want to keep it on. Yeah. They <laughs> just they just punish the hell out of us. Oh okay. Uh she has both, yeah, both the gauntlet and you explain what happened. Uh she asks okay, you take a swig of water from your water bottle whilst ha Hakusan cuts the gauntlet away from your hand with a small blade. You should stop this should stop you from losing any more strength. Now we can get on with our quest. Deep down I knew you would come with me, Hakusan says with a wry smile. Come on. We've got to go back the other way. Yes, Tromo lives west of here. <laughs> so we go back down to 11 skill. Our skill has jumped and jumped and dove. And... That deep down, you're, you'll, uh, you'll be coming with me is totally Ian Livingston just like looking directly at you through yeah. the pages being like... You ignore? Get, yeah, just, just start moving. Yeah. It's like <laughs> when you hear like, you're like, we want to do this. And your DM just goes... <sighs> okay. Uh, turn to page two. You are back at the fork in the path. Going left will take us south and out of the forest. We need to go straight on here to reach Yastromo's tower. Hakusan says without stopping, using, <laughs> turn to 252. So I literally, I had a 50% railroading you now. I could have just gone this way originally instead of going this way and trying on the gauntlet. Right. God, this game. 252. The narrow path twists and turns through the dense forest before petering out into thick undergrowth, and you have to use your sword to cut a way through. Progress is slow, but you press on. You come to a small clearing where thousands of flying insects are hovering in the sunlight. There is a very bad smell in the air, which is coming from the rotting carcass of a deer in the center of the clearing. There is a cluster of round sponge-like fungi growing out of the carcass, deep red in color, each the size of a large pumpkin. When you walk into the clearing, a fungus slides off the carcass and short hops over to you in it, its squat cons concertina-like legs. Concertina? Yeah, it's that, like... Like a ballet dancer? No, no, like uh, uh, an accordion. Like one of those little uh, It's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> a boing, a boing, a boing. It is covered with holes, which open each time it lands on the ground, puffing out clouds of red dust into the air. Launching towards you is a spore ball, a giant parasitic fungus which is contaminating the air with a cloud of toxic dust containing millions of poisonous microspores. Will you attack the spore ball with your sword, pour fire root juice onto the spore ball, hold your breath and run through the clearing. The juice! We did it! Yeah! Who, was in, who said, take the juice, reveal thyself? You genius. Watch me die. If I die from this, you're banned forever. Live life on a knife's edge. Uh, 105. The burning hot fire root juice does the job, triggering the holes, or yeah, triggering the holes covering the spore ball to close up and preventing any further spores from being released into the air. Test your luck. If you're lucky, turn to 131. If you're unlucky, turn to 62. We could actually fail this roll because you're, we have seven luck. Seven luck? Oh, yeah. wow. You, your luck we were got at nine. Brutalized. Yeah, our luck got just absolutely destroyed. All right. Seven alert. 
Eight. <laughs> okay. Nope. Unlucky. Turn to 62. You die. You did everything right. <laughs> There is so much red dust in the air that you cannot help but breathe some of it in. The spores floating inside the dust cloud are toxic, and you begin to cough violently. You drop to your knees, clutching your throat, with your lungs feeling like they are on fire. There is nothing you can do to stop yourself from suffocating. The spore ball has found a new host for its spores to grow into fungal parasites. Your adventure is over. Okay, cool. Uh, so you had the right item, and then we still failed. I'm cheating that one. 131. We're just going to see this to the end, I think. See what happens. Because, I mean, like, we got 20 minutes, right? You manage to avoid breathing in any of the spores and run through the clearing, holding your breath to join Hakusan, turn to 232. Yeah, what was she doing during all this? Nothing. Chilling. She's just like, hey, yeah, don't breathe that. You run through the clearing, holding your breath to where Hakusan is waiting for you. That was the most hideous thing I have ever seen in Darkwood Forest, she says with disgust. You carry on heading west, and progress becomes easier as the undergrowth thins out. Walking along, it dawns on you that all the birds and creatures have gone quiet, and you comment on that fact to Hakasan. Something must have spooked them, Hakasan says, drawing her sword. You stand still, listening out for any noises. What's that? asks Hakasan. You concentrate hard and hear faint rustling sounds coming from the left and then from the right. You tell Hakasan to stand back to back with you and be ready to challenge whoever is approaching. You do not have to wait long to find out who it is. Put down your swords, put down your backpacks, and walk back the way you came. There are six arrows pointed at you. You have ten seconds to make up your mind, a man's deep voice commands coldly. If you want to obey the unseen man, turn to 377. If you want to stand your ground, turn to 124. Are the arrows in bows, though? <laughs> Maybe <it's> just, <laughs> they're just pointing them at you. I mean, it's not a lie, right? <clears throat> I mean, uh, you can't go back the way you came. No, 124 it is. As Chap mentioned, theoretically, if you succeeded that luck check, your luck should be down to six now. Oh, yeah. I mean, it doesn't matter at this point if we're just cruising through everything with I mean, not an instant death. If you... If you miss your luck roll, it's not always insta-death. Yeah. Six hooded men appear from behind the trees, each of them armed with a bow and arrow pointed at you. Ah, oh, crap, Paul. <laughs> uh, bows and arrows. Yeah. The color of their clothes is light and dark brown, blending in with the forest. They have long black hair and high eye sockets blackened with charcoal dust. You are trapped and have to act quickly. You whisper to Hakasan to attack the three bandits closest to her, and you will fight the others. On the count of three, you charge at the bandits, but they anticipate your move, fire their arrows at you. If you possess a bronze a shield, turn to page 60. If you do not own a shield, turn to 204. I have a shield. Three arrows aimed at you clatter onto your shield and ricochet off it to land harmlessly to on the ground. You reach the bandits before they have time to reload, swinging your sword through the air. Fight them one at a time. All right. Wow. Suck, sucks to be the guy, like six guys all standing there with bows and none of them get a shot off to kill you guys. Yeah. Like, what's the point in holding somebody at bow point if you're not actually going to like... <laughs> the arrow deflects off your shield and into your eye. All right. First bandit. Uh, I do have an 11 skill, so they have to roll an eight or higher. Yeah. Mm. To beat me. Yeah, because yeah. you yeah they have to roll a thirteen. That's yeah. Seven. Nope. Oh wait, that I could have tied that. Shoot, I have to roll. No, I win. Uh, God, they have so much stamina. Bandit goes eight fourteen. So I win. The bandit attacks. No, I win. Bandit attacks again. It's a nine. This is 15. Uh, ooh, I lose two points. What was that 20, I think? Yeah. Eight. 
18. Bandit. No. That bandit dies. Next bandit. God, they have so much health. This one has a 7 skill. So a 16. I attack. 17. So that means he needs to roll a 7, right? Yeah. It's a 7. Which, I can tie it. Yeah, you can tie it. Yeah. yeah. yeah so. I guess you could roll like 4 dice of different colors. But yeah. To make it faster? Yeah. Yeah. 15. Uh, win. I mean, like, this is, like, the worst part, right? The most boring, the most mm. unengaging part of the whole thing, like, this combat. Like, I don't think there's a way around it or to make no, it better. I right? mean, if if there was a... Ch it's weird. Like, if there was a chance of you dying or more of a chance of you losing the combat, it would be more... Uh, but, I mean, that's not fun either because it just yeah, ends yeah. the run immediately. Like, it's just, like, that's not fun. The fun of the... The thing is, like, some of the choices we make and what I decide to skip over. I've been trying to decide what's the fun in this. And that's yeah, me yeah. and you laughing at the stuff that happens in this book. Yeah, yeah. The oddly specific ways they have of per portraying information. And, like, the combat and, like, the instant deaths are just, like, the least interesting part. Uh, all right. Anyway. Uh, that's an 8. That's a 15. Okay. And then I rolled a bunch. I mean, I have a dice roller thing that I made for when, back when you guys were playing Risk. Yeah. But I mean, like, but, eh. yeah, this is fine. It's another 15. I win. It's a two. Bandit rolls a 16. I roll a 16. We tied. Cool. Bandit rolls a 15. I roll... A bunch. Bandit dies. All right. They're all dead. If you win, turn to 22. Yeah, the fun of this game is the long-term consequences. Like, do you have this? You know what I mean? And, like, I like the exploring aspect. Like, oh, do I... What do I skip and what do I not skip, right? Yeah, yeah. That's mm -hmm. where the interest comes in. But it's like... <sighs> It's the test your luck. Oh, you died. It's like yeah. that's miserable. That's that's yeah. Usually, like in in the past uh, games, it hasn't been that harsh. Like the test your luck has just been like sends you on a more dangerous path usually. Yeah. But uh, this book is definitely more harsh on the insta deaths. Than yeah. Any My health is ones. fine. Like I barely take any damage. It's just this book has definitely had the most insta deaths, which is wild considering it's the newest it's the most modern book, right? Yeah, I remember remember at the beginning of this stream you're like, oh I bet he's like it's like a lot uh yeah. you know. No, no. Cause like I thought that's what the first book would be, just a bunch of instant deaths to make people like go back and start playing it again. Yeah, yeah. But this book has been wild. All right. Like uh, I guess presumably if you're actually like playing it properly and not you know going back and stuff it's just you just do it over and over again trying to remember which is the right way to go yeah right? or write it down okay you look around and are relieved to see that hakasan has defeated the other three bandits turn to 372. Do, 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 do. you search through the bandits belongings and find two apples a chunk of cheese wrapped in damp cloth a leather purse containing two gold pieces a silver signet ring with a horseshoe engraving and a small stoppered glass bottle containing a purple colored liquid. You take the gold pieces and think about what else might be of use to you. Will you eat the apple and cheese, try on the silver signet ring, drink the purple liquid? Throw the purple liquid. <laughs> yeah. uh, I like you can't, you, you're like, uh, I'm just going to drink this. I mean, he wouldn't have it on him. Well, I guess he would have it on him if you are like, I'm going to poison my stuff so that I can attack with it better. I mean, I have to do one of them. Mm. I'm drinking the purple liquid, Paul. Oh, yeah. Ring with a horseshoe on it. That's got to be luck, right? You'd think so. Or it turns you into a horse. <laughs> <laughs> Both good things. <laughs> yeah, you convinced me. I'm going to try on the ring. 141. I mean, if I'm a horse, I'm stronger than a human, right? You slide the signet ring onto the little finger of your left hand, half expecting something terrible to happen. 
Yep. Yep. I wonder why you do that. <laughs> yeah, who, who would have, why would the player think that? All your fingers tingle for a few seconds before returning to normal. You're wearing a tyke ring, one of the fabled rings of fortune, which are made in Vados in the Desert of Skulls. Add two luck. Hey, look at that. You go back up to eight. If you have not done so already, you can either eat the apples and cheese or drink the purple liquid. If you would rather leave the items and continue on your journey, turn to 383. I feel like one of these is poison. So it's like, is it the reverse psychology thing? Is it like apples and cheese? Those seem safe. And then, yeah. And then, oh, you died. Purple liquid. That's obviously poison. Oh, no. It's That's strength, what I'm thinking, strength right? Strength potion. Yeah, like, I'm drinking the liquid. I have to find out. You pull the cork out of the bottle with your teeth and spit it onto the ground. You sniff the liquid inside the bottle, but it is odorless. Are you sure you want to drink that? I wouldn't if I were you, Hakazan says, looking concerned. If you want to ignore her warning and drink the liquid, turn to 181. If you want to forget the idea, you can. If you have not done so already, either eat the apples and cheese or try on the signet ring. If you would rather leave now and continue your journey to Yaztromo's tower, turn to 383. <laughs> she was right last time. She was right about the mushrooms. Yeah. I mean, she can't be right all the time, though, right? I mean, maybe. Yeah, let's find out. We're almost near the end of the stream anyway, so. You place the bottle to your lips, hesitating for a second before gulping down the liquid. You feel a warm glow in your throat, which spreads down into your stomach. You have drunk a potion of strength. Add two skill, three stamina, and one luck. What did I say it would be? <laughs> potion of strength. <laughs> oh, we're back up to 13 skill, baby. That uh, apple and cheese will kill you. <laughs> yeah, I kind of want to find... Now I have to know. How much point? One luck? We're back up to nine luck. Wow. With a smug grin on your face, you apologize insincerely to Hakusan for drinking it all. If you have not done so already, you may either eat the apples and cheese or try the signet ring. Okay, we're going to try to eat the apples and cheese. The apples are crisp and juicy and the cheese is crumbly and very tasty. Add two stamina points. It was all good? <laughs> uh, this is Ian, this is Ian Livingston just being like, see? What? Yeah, what? Yeah, what are you complaining about? Yeah, I'm always nice to you. <laughs> Enjoy the book, idiot. He's <laughs> totally gaslighting you. Yeah, yeah 383. <laughs> we're going to the tower. I think we're almost at the end. You reach a section of the forest where the trees are closely packed together, making it difficult to see very far ahead. You walk on and almost stumble onto a rope ladder, which is suspended from an old oak tree. You look up to see that rope ladder is hanging down from an open hatch of a large wooden tree house. You call out, but there is no reply. You step warily onto the rope ladder and or climb slowly up through the open trap door. You find yourself in a square room, which serves as an all-in-one living room, bedroom, and kitchen. There is nobody at home, and you give the all-clear sign for Hakusan to climb up the rope ladder to join you. There is a wooden bed covered with animal furs in the corner of the far right-hand wall. Or, there is a, sorry, there is a wooden bed covered with animal furs in the corner of the far right-hand wall, in front of which stands a large wooden chest with a beetle carving on the lid. A pan of vegetable soup is simmering on top of the small wood-burning stove. In the center of the room, there are two chairs tucked under the table. Which, is, which has a candle glued to a skull wielded, welded to the table by thick lines of melted wax. Shelves fixed to the right-hand wall are lined with old leather-bound books kept upright by more animal skulls used as bookends. You cannot help but notice an unpleasant smell like rotten cabbage filling the room. Will you drink the soup, look at the books, open the wooden chest? If you don't want to stay in the trios and would rather leave to continue the journey to Yastromo's Tower, turn to 251. This is totally what's his name's place. Like the guy who makes trap boxes. Like the box, oh, the box has like a Germal Jangles or Germal Jangles. <laughs> Jimble Jambles. I can't his, remember his name. Gunder Jangles. But his his thing was trap chest with beetles on the on the lid. It's got to be something bad there. Yeah. Well, let's find out. 30, then again, three seventy six. Knows how to get into it. Three seventy six. You lift the lid of the wooden chest and see that it is filled with lots of wooden boxes, all of this, all with the same ornately carved lid featuring a beetle motif identical to the one you found. You are convinced you have found Gernard Jaggle's home. 
and the hot soup on the stove suggests to you that he is still very much alive. Hakusan agrees, saying, maybe we should wait here until he returns. If you want to wait for Gurnar Jagel to appear, to appear, turn to 280. If you'd rather leave the treehouse and carry on towards the Astromos Tower, turn to 251. So, I will say, um, the Maricat in the chat says that apparently, according to like a walkthrough, you're nowhere near the end. Really? We might have to stop. It has been three hours. Um, so, according to my uh, little... Uh, and so as we've been going through this, I have a little script that's been recording each page you go to. Mm -hmm. We can uh, kind of leave off where we. You've we can... been so you, you've gone to like a hundred and eight or something different items out of the four hundred. So oh, jeez! But you don't obviously you don't go to all of the pages over the course of the entire over the course of one playthrough. Yeah, we can like pretty much like okay. So when we last left off, we were waiting for. Gernard Jagel. I mean, this seems like a reasonable place to yeah, leave off. I think that's pretty good. So, uh, well, I don't know, maybe mark the page just so... Well, I'll be 376, happy I guess, is like... We'll write it down somewhere. Or I'm sure Twitch chat will remember. You know what I mean? Like That seems like something they do. Yeah. I could, dum, put dum, a, dum. I could put a note on my phone. I'll put a note in my phone. Page 376, yeah. Oh, that's wild. All right. Well, there was a lot of wow. instant kill mechanics, but also a lot more, a lot more reading and less decision making. Yeah, some of those entries were long. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, that's why it's such a much bigger book than the previous one. Yeah, we have three page long entries. Yeah. Oh, that was wild. All right. Well, uh, that will do it for this special edition of Dice Friends. Appreciate everybody that hung out. Um, once again, a reminder that this stream was brought to you by wormwoodgaming.com. Uh, if you use the affiliate code LRR within North America, you get free shipping. And then anywhere else, use the code LRR World for you, $10 off. In the US. Oh, in the US. Okay, sorry. US. You're, yeah, in the US, use the affiliate code LRR. I can read. And everywhere else, use LRR World for $10 off. Also, this stream is brought to you by you with your wonderful support at patreon.com slash loading ready run for myself adam from paul that's it for us